uh, Bapak Guri yang yang from Iali Lampung, and uh, fellow friends from Iali, and uh, so, uh, some people from this group LH Kabupaten Mempawa, and all participants who join the lecture. Uh, welcome to the webinar of International Lecture Landscape Architecture Series 2.1 uh, with the title, title uh, Application of Pocket Gardens and Landscape Space in Urban Context and Delivering Urban si Ecosystem Service Does Plan Choice Matter? Uh, in this uh, uh, this international lecture is a collaboration between ITERA and UTM. And I, Septimoldia, will be your moderator during this lecture. Uh, allow me to describe the schedule today. Uh, we are going to start from opening speech from the Dean of Department of Technology, Infrastructure, and Regional Studies from Dr. Rahayu Sulistiorini, and opening speech from the Head of Landscape Architecture Program, Bambang Sulistiantoro. Uh, and uh, we are going to follow by uh, lecture from Associate Professor Dr. Maslina Mansor with title Application of Pocket Garden and Landscape Space in Urban Context and closed by uh, lecture from Siti Nurhana Ismail MA PhD with title Delivering Urban Ecosystem Service Does Plain Choice Matter and we are going to follow with discussion session and uh, uh, close with the closing statement from keynote speakers and followed by a closing statement from moderator and documentation. Yeah. Okay, let's start this webinar with opening speech from the Dean of Department of uh, Technology, uh, Infrastructure and Regional Studies, Dr. Rahayu Sulistiorini. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rahayu. Uh, would you like to start your opening speech, please? Thank you, uh, moderator. The Honorable Association uh, Professor Dr. Maslina Mansur, uh, Miss Siti Nurhana Ismail, uh, PhD. The Head of Landscape Architecture, uh, my college, Pro, uh, Dr. Bambang Sulistiantara, and his secretary, Mr. Edwin Eko. Uh, all participants uh, will who will join uh, this event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Salam sejahtera Welcome, bagi kita semua. Shalom, Om Swastiatu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Uh, first thing first, let us praise to God uh, who has been pouring us bless and mercies so we could be here together with good health. I would like to deliver a bunch of thanks, especially for uh, Architecture Landscape uh, Depart uh, program. Uh, the speaker from UTM, thank you, Miss uh, both of you. Uh, welcome to ITERA. Uh, yeah, uh, in this time, maybe a uh, limited uh, uh, time because we join with daring or uh, online. But actually, if the condition is uh, possible for us, I think uh, it is good for <laughs> both of you to see uh, Institut Teknologi Sumatera in Lampung, uh, South Sumatera. And uh, Thanks to all participants uh, for your patience and intuition to join this event. Uh, I think it is an uh, interesting topic because uh, many problem in urban and uh, limited land and maybe uh, many problems. So I think it is good uh, idea to, to give a webinar uh, with topic, uh, especially in architecture landscape. Uh, maybe uh, I think ecosystem service is important for us because uh, limited land, uh, maybe yeah, uh, in form of uh, street or park or urban forest or cultivated land and wetland. 
uh, this system may be uh, generated in uh, ecosystem service. So I think it is a good topic and uh, advantage uh, uh, knowledge for us to see uh, what kind of uh, uh, material from both of uh, our speaker from UTM. So uh, as a dean and as a behalf of ITERA, I would like to thanks again. And I hope all of uh, participants can join this event and uh, take many advantage to uh, uh, this uh, lecture. And I hope uh, the event uh, can run well and I am sorry uh, if any mistake or a lack of uh, yeah lack of mistake uh, from this uh, event. So we are grateful to have you all uh, here via online. We do hope to meet all of you directly soon after the pandemic is over. Thank you. And uh, as a dean, I open this event. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahayu, for the opening speech. Uh, and then we'll continue the opening speech with, uh, we'll continue the opening speech from the head of landscape architecture program, ITERA, Dr. Bambang Sulias, Sulis Piantoro. Uh, silakan, Pak Bambang. Thank you. And, uh, okay, thank you very much, Ibu Septi. Uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Uh, this is uh, to whom I'm very uh, respecting. Of course, uh, first uh, to the Dean of GTIK. Itera, Ibu Dr. Rahayu Sulistiorini. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, to the uh, Professor Dr. Masdina Mansur from the Department of Landscape Architecture, IIUM, International Islamic University Malaysia, and also for Dr. Siti Nurhana, yeah, Dr. Siti Nurhana from the Faculty of Built Environment and Surveying, University Technology Malaysia. And of course, uh, I'm very respect to also two uh, lecturers and students from the ITERA Landscape Architecture Study Program. Uh, I will uh, introduce also from our faculty staff here, uh, Ibu Septi Maulida as a moderator now for this uh, lecture. And then Mr. Edwin, Edwin uh, Eko Franjaya as a secretary of study program. And then Mr. Anggi Mardianto also presenting here. Mr. Anggi will uh, go to study abroad at Kyoto University maybe for next week. Uh, and then uh, Ibu Indah Prastiwi, okay. Uh, here also presenting Ibu Rian, Ibu Rian also here, Ibu Rian Alditya. And then Ibu Rizka, Ibu Rizka, Ibu Rain, Ibu Rain is already here, inshallah, Ibu Rain Susindasti. Pak Martin, and also Ibu Poppy as a teaching assistant. Ya, Alhamdulillah, uh, of course, first we should uh, be grateful uh, because in this sunny morning, we can meet in this online international lecture program. Hopefully, in this bright atmosphere, uh, can encourage uh, all of us to study more diligently. Welcome to our two uh, dear speakers from Malaysia. We are very happy to have uh, the opportunity to learn from lecture from uh, Malaysia. For us, uh, especially for students of uh, ITERA Landscape Architecture Program, 
this international course is an opportunity to uh, that is uh, always uh, awaited for us uh, <clears throat> regarding to the lecture plan today we will uh, be a lecture with the tema application of uh, pocket garden and landscape spaces in an urban context by Dr. Masrina Mansour. Yeah, of course, uh, this material is very important. And in accordance uh, with the learning outcome of courses taught uh, at ITERA. Likewise, uh, also the second material uh, entitled Providing Urban Ecosystem Services. Our plan choice is important. Uh, this theme is also very important uh, for detecting, directing, uh, yeah, directing the landscape design that is more functional and appropriate to the environmental context. The second material will <clears throat> be delivered by Dr. Siti Nur Hana. Thank you for that. Uh, as a head of uh, ITERA Landscape uh, Architecture Study Program, <clears throat> I am very proud and grateful to the two speakers who have been uh, taken who have taken their time in the midst of their busy schedule. Currently, uh, the form of lecture that is carried out in is uh, in online lecture. Of course, uh, we need uh, to be grateful because we can learn together even though <clears throat> we are not in the same place. <clears throat> Yeah, but uh, the disadvantage is uh, that it is uh, more difficult yeah, to have a smooth discussion like uh, the first uh, lecture by Professor Ismail bin Said. Uh, we really hope that uh, in the future, we can create a collaborative student workshop like that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, conducted at ITERA campus. Uh, if uh, I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, it seemed like a few years ago I had uh, the opportunity to meet Dr. Masliza and Dr. Siti Noor in Bogor, maybe, yeah. At this time, uh, I was uh, assigned as, uh, assigned as uh, IPB University and currently uh, <clears throat> I have uh, additional assignment as a uh, Head of the landscape architecture study at program at ITERA. Uh, therefore, I am very happy to have the opportunity to expand a wider cooperation network. Uh, on this occasion, I also uh, want to express my deepest uh, gratitude to the Dean of GTIK, again, Dr. Rahayu Sristiorini. Uh, Dr. Rahayu is very good Dean and uh, always encourage the investment uh, of landscape architecture study program um, yeah because this study program is still very young we always ask uh, the dean for the guidance to the student please uh, listen carefully uh, to the material that will be delivered by the lecturer from uh, malaysia uh, please uh, the student prepare some question, yeah, uh, listen and then uh, make uh, some question. Also to the professionals who are uh, as the member of this uh, event, appreciation is uh, conveyed for their participation. We hope it will be necessary to add the uh, insight into their professional work. Once again, we would like to thank to Dr. Maslina and Dr. Sitinur for the knowledge and experience that will be uh, said here. We wish all the best for of luck and success for this event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Bang Bang, for the opening speech. Uh, okay, let's continue this webinar with a lecture from Dr. Maslina Mansour. Before we start the lecture, allow me to describe the brief profile of Dr. Maslina Mansour to the audience in Indonesia. Uh, 
Dr. Maslina Mansar uh, adalah asosiat profesor di Department of Landscape Architecture, Kuliah of Architecture and Environmental Design, International Islamic uh, University, Malaysia. Uh, dia memiliki background pendidikan di Environmental Design di University of Tasmania, Australia, uh, Environmental Management di Universiti Kebangsaan Malaysia, dan Landscape Architecture di Universiti Teknologi Malaysia. Nah, lingkup bidang riset beliau diantaranya urban public space, uh, urban green infrastructure, human ecology, environment uh, behavior studies, and cultural landscape, dan and heritage. Uh, Dr. Maslina Mansor sudah mengajar di kuliah of Architecture and Environmental Design IIUM sejak tahun 2003. Uh, welcome Dr. Maslina Mansor. Uh, would you like to start your lecture, please? Uh, okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I heard I heard my voice bouncing <laughs> back to to me. Eh? Uh, it's okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, uh, very much yeah, for the warm welcome uh, and. Um, um, I would like to uh, to thank the Dean of Department of Technology Infra, uh, Dr. Rahayu, uh, the Head of Landscape Architecture Department, uh, Dr. Bambang, uh, also made, uh, to our mo Madam Moderator, uh, uh, Madam Septi, and of course, not to forget uh, Mr. Edwin. But before that, uh, uh, let me share you uh, uh, the presentation slides. Yeah. All right, can you see the, the sharing of the uh, presentation? Yes. Yes, yeah, okay, uh, very good. Okay, I hope uh, all students, staff, and, um, uh, and the participants of uh, this uh, lecture series are well and uh, are safe uh, in this uh, trying time, yeah, inshallah. And uh, what uh, I'm going to share with you today is on the topic application of pocket gardens and landscape spaces in urban context. Uh, it is just a, uh, it, it is a, just a light sharing uh, uh, to share with you in terms of uh, knowledge of the uh, urban spaces. Uh, so let me, uh, let's have a look at the contents. Um, uh, the first one is talking about the typology of uh, pocket gardens and landscape uh, spaces in urban context. And then uh, we're going to uh, see about the use and activities of the urban spaces and what makes uh, these uh, uh, small spaces uh, have a successful uh, place making in terms of uh, our role as landscape architects and designers or even planners. Uh, so as a landscape architect and designers, uh, uh, to, to do a placemaking, we have to use our capability in terms of composing the landscape spatial materials and, and also the form of design, uh, in which later I will uh, uh, present to you. And then um, I will show you uh, just a, a, a bit of example of projects that uh, my students have involved in, uh, in uh, concerning the uh, the, the, the small spaces in uh, urban uh, area, especially uh, in the context of Kuala Lumpur City, as well as uh, we are going to look at the summary of the attributes of these uh, successful uh, landscape spaces. Okay, if you see this, um, if you look at these uh, diagrams that uh, I tried to summarize, uh, in terms of uh, the typology of uh, open uh, spaces or public spaces, uh, we can call it as a green amenity, urban green amenity, uh, communal space or uh, public realms uh, in the context of urban area. But uh, in my study, I always refer it to, uh, to as a green infrastructure services, uh, ranging from the micro scale, uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, scale, 
up to the smallest one. So I have put here in this diagram uh, several categories of the large uh, uh, public spaces or uh, natural areas up to the smallest one according to my studies and understanding yeah, um, uh, throughout the years. All right, uh, if you can see here, if you look at this macro scale um, green infrastructure, it's actually a, a bit more natural, uh, natural spaces because it involves national park and state park, which can be located in a, at a regional area uh, or in a, uh, in a state, uh, uh, such as in Selangor, in, in the context of Malaysia, Selangor, um, uh, in Pera, in Pahang, and so on. So they are um, unlimited size and also population and their characteristic is a bit uh, natural uh, such as forest and botanical garden um, for the city scale and the neighborhood scale uh, these are in a form of a recreational area for people to enjoy for the urban population uh, to go uh, for their leisure activities uh, so i have uh, this uh, i have categorized uh, this um, urban landscape spaces as uh, city park or urban park, uh, district park, local park, neighborhood park, play, uh, play field and playground at the neighborhood scale. And also the smallest one is what we call a play lot. So these, uh, these um, categorization are based on the Department of Town and Country Planning uh, in Malaysia. Um, so uh, uh, the, the range of these uh, recreational parks and also natural area are based on their uh, size and also uh, how many population that they serve. But uh, what I want to draw your attention here uh, in this uh, lecture is that uh, the most underrated uh, spaces that are scattered in a uh, urban area, especially in Kuala Lumpur and in the big cities, uh, they, they are called small landscape spaces. Uh, in which I, I, I call, uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I call it as pocket gardens and urban landscape spaces. Here I have uh, tried to, I, I try to categorize them into several uh, classification. Uh, so what I come out here is that uh, at least we can get uh, four big categories of uh, small uh, landscape uh, spaces uh, in an in, in, in urban area. Uh, for example, here, the uh, bigger uh, umbrella of uh, the small spaces, uh, I can call it as civic open space. Uh, secondly, is the pocket gardens. Uh, the third one is the linear spaces. And finally, the smallest versions of um, uh, landscape urban spaces are what we call parklet, couplet, and other uh, incidental spaces. Uh, in and around city center. So I will explain this uh, a bit further later, um, uh, just to give you uh, examples. So these uh, small uh, landscape spaces are actually what we call the, uh, the, the, the spaces that are very important, uh, that actually can contribute a lot more to um, place making in a city, as well as uh, even contribute to the urban environment. Uh, in terms of permeability and uh, as well as a contribution to the natural uh, uh, natural vegetation. Okay, for example, here I try to uh, show you um, uh, the, the the Google map of uh, KL, eh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, uh, for uh, we can see here, of course, uh, there are a lot of. Uh, structure built built form uh, all the buildings and so on uh, in inside uh, this uh, map but uh, if we notice it carefully we can see that uh, the spaces that i mean mentioned before the four categories are scattered actually in and around the spaces for example is if you can see the green area here is, uh, here is quite big so those are what i uh, i consider it as a uh, the potential for pocket spaces uh, and then the street uh, linear spaces um, and the smaller version of the spaces in between uh, this building uh, if you are able to uh, notice that uh, a lot uh, a lot of uh, spaces in front of the compound of a building or at the back uh, uh, side of a uh, building Right, yeah. Um, 
if we were to define uh, what is the meaning of pocket garden and spaces, uh, they are basically a small scale urban space. And uh, their nature is they are scattered throughout the urban fabric. For example, I try to, I try to make a diagram here. Uh, let's say that we have uh, urban space. So those uh, kind of smaller spaces, for example, uh, for civic open spaces, we can categorize it further into padang, medan, plaza, square, and for pocket gardens, they can be called. There, there are many terms uh, that that uh, you can call it. I think. Uh, the terms are similar even though in our context like in Kuala Lumpur we say it different thing maybe in Sumatra in Lampung uh, the all the pocket gardens are ha, has their own uh, terms in, in which we will uh, maybe later uh, inshallah in the future we are able to learn uh, from uh, from uh, the students and the staff in the uh, itera, eh? pocket gardens. Uh, I try to classify it into smaller spaces such as mini park, vast pocket garden, uh, secluded flower garden, and also the linear spaces, uh, the long, uh, the long line of spaces, uh, which usually located in a commercial area, uh, which I call pedestrian malls, st uh, streetscapes, active frontage, uh, five foot walkway or corridor. So their nature uh, is that they serve the immediate uh, local population and they are designed for heavy use by uh, for people eh, for, for the immediate users to use it. And uh, usually they are located at a dense area. Uh, and then they can be created on vacant lots. Uh, let's see in a building, sometimes that building is so run down and it's become a uh, uh, very neglected. So that area for landscape architects is, is an opportunity to turn it into a nice um, pocket spaces uh, in, in the vacant lot. And also it can uh, contribute in terms of uh, increase the amount of permeable surfaces uh, throughout the city center. Okay, let me... Um, uh, try to give a bit of a definition uh, on the category that I uh, that I put uh, just now in terms of the smaller spaces and how they contribute to the placemaking of uh, a city. For example, here in the context of Kuala Lumpur, uh, when I say uh, civic open space, it can be padang, plaza or square. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a Datara Merdeka in Kuala Lumpur. It is uh, uh, an open play field or what we call Padang. And uh, this is a very old uh, square in uh, also in a Kuala, uh, in an old part of Kuala Lumpur, uh, which uh, we call Medan Pasar. So this, uh, you can, as you can see here, the activities are very vibrant with the, with people. Uh, and it, it is very useful uh, for social uh, get, gathering and so on. Most probably now during the pandemic, uh, it's, it's, it, it will be empty. Lah. But uh, I'm sure inshallah in the, uh, in the future, it, uh, when our life uh, going back into normal, uh, inshallah they will be vibrant uh, as, uh, as uh, before. Yeah? Uh, so this is what we, uh, uh, they serve as a stage for public life, the setting where celebrations are held, social and economic exchange uh, take place and also where all types of culture mix together. So they are a melting pot of, um, uh, of uh, activities. And uh, they are the front porch of public institution because usually they are located in front of a building um, where we can interact with uh, one another. Okay, the second type is uh, what I call public, uh, pocket gardens. Uh, they, they can be categorized as uh, pocket parks, uh, mini park, pocket space, uh, vast pocket garden, and also secluded flower gardens. For example, here, um, uh, usually uh, small pocket gardens are located in front of commercial build building to attract a user or to give a, a user a bit of refuge when they are doing their uh, activity. Yeah? such as shopping and so on. Uh, as you can see here, this is a pocket garden in front of one uh, one shopping complex in uh, Kuala Lumpur, in the center of Kuala Lumpur. And this one is a pocket garden in front of uh, also a shopping district in Kuala Lumpur. Um, of course, they have lots of uh, users yeah, for small event space, 
uh, for uh, play areas uh, for children, uh, spaces for relaxing or meeting friends or for workers uh, when they take lunch, they can have their lunch uh, in the space. The third category is um, a linear landscape uh, space. A linear landscape space is spaces that are uh, long, uh, then it is wide. Uh, so they are categorized as pedestrian mall, streetscape, uh, three link street, active frontage, and also five foot walkway and corridor. Uh, for example, in, in KL here, we can see that in front of this uh, busy shopping district, uh, there is a long uh, pedestrian uh, uh, pedestrian mall uh, with a uh, street landscape uh, and other image that I put here in overseas to show you that uh, uh, how linear they can be and also some images yeah, uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the design of the street. And uh, the last but not least uh, of the parklet, uh, of the small space are what we call parklet and curblet. Maybe maybe this is a new term. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, currently or most recently, uh, uh, they are, they appear in the in the dictionary of uh, small spaces. Yeah, parklet and curblet, vacant lot and small incidents, incidental uh, space or what we call loose fit uh, space. So they are actually a small extension of space at a sidewalk that provides more space and amenities for people when they are using the street here for example so we design it we take uh, we take a part of the parking lot instead of using it for parking uh, to uh, install uh, landscape uh, spaces and uh, even taking the curb uh, curb, uh, curb and turn it into landscape uh, spaces with a very uh, simple uh, landscape furniture or a bit of uh, landscaping. Uh, a pub, uh, uh, it is a public amenity including outdoor space for nearby cafes and restaurants, uh, bike racks, planter boxes, benches and landscaping. Okay, so those are the, the, the four, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, <laughs> let me So, um, uh, so those are the four types of um, uh, small landscape spaces that I would like to draw your attention to because I think instead of us uh, focusing more on rec big recreational park in which there are of course lots of subspaces inside the recreational park, but we should not forget the small spaces because there are a lot, uh, there are a lot of them and variety of them inside uh, an urban area uh, doesn't matter where the context is uh, you can find uh, a lot of them in the city and hopefully if you realize that uh, their importance we are able to uh, regenerate them or even uh, taking care of uh, these spaces so why do we need to design the small spaces in a city of course uh, for a lot of reason for example most definitely uh, they are the green amenity of uh, our environment. Uh, it is for the community, it is for gathering, it's for recreation, it's for history. Sometimes they uh, have uh, this cultural or historical um, uh, historical events that took place there uh, they, uh, for celebration, for art uh, display, and also for performance. As you can see here, I tried to put it in illustration, the example of a simple uh, street in an urban area, uh, in in this image, you can see a lot of small spaces uh, that happen. For example, here uh, we can see a parklet and curblet extending out from the street, and then uh, a streetscape with a, a nice a shaded trees, a tree link walkway, and also this active frontage where uh, a bit active in terms of social activities such as eating and so on. Okay, so uh, when we design a good landscape uh, spaces, it allows people for a variety of uh, necessary and voluntary activity. Okay, what I mean by uh, necessary activities, or for, for example, of course, uh, usually uh, all the necessary activities such as working, living, uh, doing business happen uh, in, in a city or 
um, uh, in the middle of a city or in a suburb where people go for their compulsory activity for their daily lives, um, uh, such as working and so on. So they will, this will happen in a building. So the architecture people will design the building uh, to meet this necessary activity of working, living and doing business. As for landscape architects, uh, we try to match the environment so that it suits the uh, needs for this necessary activity or even uh, to get people from point A uh, to point uh, B uh, in doing their daily business activities in, a, in, in an urban area. Okay, as for voluntary activity, uh, voluntary activity means uh, activities that you do at your le uh, leisure time. Right. For example, you have more time uh, to go to the town center or to the urban area. Uh, you can enjoy the environment inside the, uh, the, the urban spaces. Therefore, as landscape architects or designers or planners, uh, we have to design it so that it can be as much as com uh, comfortable as possible for people to be around uh, in, in the town or in the city. So, for example, here in the parklet or curblet, we can gather, uh, we seek refuge, we can watch people uh, go by, uh, even we can sit uh, along the streetscape here, uh, do the cycling activities, walking, and also um, when there is a um, uh, a spillover of a um, uh, commercial area, we can eat outdoors uh, when we have outdoor eating areas. So um, looking very, uh, very nice in terms of uh, various types of activity that landscape architect can contribute to uh, the, the outdoor environments by creating these small spaces. Okay, so uh, basically uh, to summarize what, uh, why do we need them, of course, uh, they are the green amenity of our uh, our urban space. Uh, they are also a communal space, spaces for the community, and they are a part of public realms uh, in uh, in a city. Uh, so the outdoor area provides additional facilities for uh, urban residents uh, to enjoy, uh, to relax, to socialize, and uh, if we have these uh, small pocket gardens and small landscape spaces that is designed well, uh, they can have a strong aesthetic appeal or even functionals and they can invite users to spend time in, in them. So they will make uh, the outdoor landscape of a building very inviting and attractive. So they complement the building that the architects design. And the resulting activity in these spaces would make building within them look livelier, uh, look vibrant, convivial and so on. Uh, and of course, it will enhance the overall appearance uh, of the surrounding area. And their en enhancement also will increase the functional value of the space and the surrounding area. Okay. Uh, for example, here in Kuala Lumpur City Center, uh, the, our city municipality, as well as the uh, NGOs trying to put together a very nice uh, spaces. Uh, for example, here in Laman Tumpera in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, by Ting City. They design uh, uh, a very natural area in the middle of a city, uh, uh, very quiet, even though uh, Kuala Lumpur is uh, very busy. And this is a new township. Uh, it's not a township, it's a city center, uh, which is called Tun Raza Exchange. And inside this, a variety of landscape spaces that are beautiful, uh, or even uh, to the smallest pocket space, they design it very well. So, um, we are trying to, to make sure that the urban environment is livable for the urban people. Because nowadays we know that migration happens from the rural to the, uh, uh, to the city. Uh, most probably in 50 years time, uh, the, the urban, our urban children will, will migrate to the rural because of uh, the, the condition of the city center. We're not, we are not sure about that. All right. Yeah. So, in order for have uh, for us to have all this um, all this uh, condition or this comfort in uh, in an urban spaces through these uh, small spaces, as landscape architects and designers, we uh, we have the capability uh, to to design it uh, using our tools. Yeah, our tools or our elements. Yeah, uh, for landscape architects. Um, uh, this is for students eh, who are in this um, uh, in this lecture series. Of course, the uh, landscape architect, uh, like uh, like an artist who paint, their their lens, uh, the, their palette are the 
uh, the colors and the uh, whatever that they put on their canvas. Uh, as we we as landscape architect, we use uh, these uh, five elements. We compose it very nicely on the ground plane because we don't have a definite uh, a definite wall, ceiling, and floor. So uh, in order for us to design, we have to use uh, this uh, landscape architecture palette. I call it the landscape architecture palette, or sometimes people call it spatial material. Uh, sometimes um, uh, 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 landscape architects or designer call it spatial elements. So we compose the ground plane, the wall plane, and sometimes the sky plane uh, in order to define the space to make it rooms, the outside room. So, Mm, first is landform, of course. Secondly, our niche area, the softscape elements. Third is the hardscape. Uh, fourth is the structure, and fifth is uh, is the water element. Let me um, give you a bit of detail uh, for each of the uh, the the spatial materials. Okay, for landform, uh, even though we have small spaces in the city, we can. Uh, utilize uh, the tools, yeah, our uh, spatial material uh, landform. I'll give you an example. Let's say we have just uh, one space that have no definite room uh, with, a, with a manipulation or with a, uh, alteration of the landform, we are able to define space into such a nice character of uh, spaces. Yeah, so uh, we can see here uh, with a uh, with a composition of a soft landscape element, the landform and the structure, we are able to define the outdoor space nicely. So, for example, I've taken here from Mata Schwartz, a partner, so very famous landscape architect and the company. Uh, they uh, they design, of course, the urban spaces, but uh, here the the example here quite uh, quite a large open space uh, in terms of square and in terms of plaza. This is in Abu Dhabi and this is in Minneapolis. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to show that uh, as landscape architects, uh, we, uh, we can, uh, the design can be very simple just by using landform, we are able to create a very nice environment to the spaces, as you can see uh, here in the design. Yeah, for soft landscape uh, materials, so soft landscape materials are our niche area. When when people ask, or oh, you are taking landscape architecture, the uh, the things that we, they will ask, or oh, uh, what what is this plant called? What is uh, this? Uh, uh, because it is our our what we call niche area, our specialty. So uh, with uh, this soft landscape element, we are able to compose the outdoor rooms, the outdoor environment, oh, right. because we have variety of types Our, of uh, soft landscape um, and they are they have lots of different form in terms of their structural image uh, whether uh, the trees or the palms or uh, other types of landscape material uh, uh, the shapes in uh, in columns spreading round weeping pyramidal festigated or picturesque uh, they are able uh, to create a nice room if we compose it in a well manner so they are able to to be, uh, to be, um, uh, to be, uh, uh, to portray architectural and aesthetic function in terms of their form, color, and texture. Uh, among uh, among the the possible characteristic or the effect that can, they can produce, or such as, they can create theme focal point. Uh, they can very be very welcoming. They can create identity of the place. They can enhance the building facade, soften the building outlines, uh, give sense of direction, uh, give shade, give the more comfort, uh, have a unifying effect to the whole uh, environment of the spaces. Uh, they can frame view. Uh, they can be decorative. They can accent or contrast, uh, giving contrast. They can give silhouette and reflection as well as they can produce a nice, uh, sweet smelling uh, smell. Um, okay, the third uh, and fourth categories of spatial material that landscape architect can use to design these small spaces. For example, just now, for the small spaces, um, we have to select a small size tree and shrubs and mostly it, it has to be simple design so that that uh, that uh, uh, that, that spaces uh, is not too overwhelming in terms of 
uh, the composition of the five spatial materials that I mentioned just now. Okay, hardscape and structure, for example, here, of course, uh, we are dealing with a nice uh, structure uh, where uh, our student will design uh, various types of uh, landscape furniture, sculpture, and so on and so forth. So we, uh, I, I try to categorize the hardscape and structure into several uh, classification. For example, the surface materials, the separating and enclosing elements such as wall, bollard, and fans. Uh, linkages uh, which can be under structure such as the bridge gateway uh, landscape architect are involved in doing the, uh, the the scope of work as well and also site furnishing uh, such as the seatings and the lighting and the focal elements of uh, uh, such as sculpture gazebo and shelter as you can see here i've taken again uh, from Martha schwartz uh, partners uh, their designs uh, showing a nice uh, surface elements uh, structures and also even the uh, uh, landscape furniture. Uh, water I'm sorry, Mas, uh, Dr. Maslina, uh, your uh, mix speaker is muted. Please uh, turn on your mic. Uh, okay, can, can you hear it? Have I been talking for, uh, to myself? For no, no, no. And the uh, water element. Uh, all right, all right. Okay, okay. hang on. Not so too far. That's fine. All right, yeah. Uh, so for water element, of course, uh, it is close to our hearts and uh, all uh, people are attracted to water element most probably even if it is a small space we can design it by using this one of the unique uh, spatial material okay uh, where we can categorize the water element into various types as well so there are a variety of uh, what i mean here there are a variety of tools that we can use in order to design but the idea is that when we have small spaces it has to be very simple design when we are composing the, this five element so you have to know uh, which one uh, is the do the most dominant and which is the uh, the one that uh, you want to omit or maybe uh, uh, put a, uh, uh, the, the least yeah, to the design. Um, uh, flat static water, flowing water or falling water elements such as uh, in this example. Yeah? Um, a very nice uh, the, the organization of water element based on form composition in which later I will uh, tie it together yeah so the second uh, part of uh, what uh, landscape architects or designer can do is of course uh, when we are trying to compose those landscape uh, spatial materials we need to have a certain type of uh, approach so that approach is what we call form of design or form composition it is a series of solution with the same basic functional arrangement by each with a different theme character and form i think uh, most of you have learned in your classes already in terms of this uh, design because we uh, as landscape architects uh, architectural students we are doing studio subject where we need to design and put things together right so um uh, those uh, spatial material together with the form of composition will make sure that our designs uh, is functional, useful, produce aesthetic quality for users to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, enjoy the space. Okay, for example, I'm giving here just a, just a basic uh, information uh, on different types of uh, approach that we can do for a small scale site. A small scale site, if we have those five spatial material, what we can do is that try to select uh, a, a form of design uh, which are proposed by Mike Lin in his book. Uh, of course, all, all of us will uh, have to refer to this all uh, to, to this seminal uh, book. Yeah? For example, here, if you are using uh, geometry, we can choose various types of uh, uh, types of form. Uh, let's say, let's imagine that we have just a very small square uh, space in a city. So we can use either rectilinear, 90 degree, curvilinear, uh, even radial, circular, arc and tangent, um, uh, rectilinear 45 degree or 30 to 60 degree, uh, and the irregular pattern uh, for to form the design. And inside 
here, of course, they are our composition of those spatial material that I mentioned before, right? And uh, most probably, if we don't want to use geome geometric pattern, we are able to choose many other types of uh, design approach, such as symbolic, free form, or organic, such as this. So up to us as a designer. But uh, most importantly, uh, we must put the function first the pro in the programming. Uh, we must know what users needs and so on, uh, what they desire for that spaces. Uh, we just cannot design as we like because we are not the main player. Uh, the main players are the, the user, the public who are going to use the space. That's why we are doing the site planning process. So we have to do to do the data collection first, uh, uh, site assessment first, uh, and then uh, we, uh, so that we are able to know the, the attributes, uh, what the users need in terms of their social needs, cultural needs, physical needs, and so on. Okay, um, I'm going to give just a bit of example on the projects that we did uh, in the middle of the uh, Kuala Lumpur city. Um, in 2018, this is um, a project by Think City uh, in collaboration with uh, Dewan Bandaraya Kuala Lumpur, which is the city city municip uh, municipality of uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, together with many uh, many universities and our students uh, of IIUM International Islamic University Malaysia uh, had involved in. Uh, some of the spaces. So I'm just uh, sharing with you uh, our activities uh, on the spaces. Uh, so we were given uh, uh, two parklet, two kerblet, and one square, uh, Medan Pasa, uh, to do survey. Um, so um, the two parklet and uh, two kerblets are uh, scattered uh, inside uh, Kuala Lumpur City. Uh, but at the same time, um, the students uh, have a, 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 the event is called uh, World Urban Forum 9 in 2018. Uh, it took place uh, around two weeks and our students involved throughout the, the, uh, the, the event time. And uh, the students involved uh, were the uh, second year urban design studio, uh, Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from CAED. Uh, our faculty is named uh, Kulia of Architecture and Environmental Design, CAED in IIUM. So the activities that the student did, for example, uh, this, uh, this are, uh, these were designed uh, uh, for, uh, for Think City by other uh, organization. Uh, so they took several parklet, two couplets here, uh, parklets here, and then they proposed design which were constructed on site during the event, uh, before the event happened, uh, World uh, Urban Forum. And the other one is what we call couplet. Couplet is located on the curb rather than on the, the parking space. So they turn it into a nice, a small uh, landscape spaces. Um, where the students uh, need to find out uh, what the users feel about those spaces once they were constructed on site. So our students involved in, uh, in surveying, they became the enumerators uh, for the program. So they surveyed uh, what the public think about the spaces, uh, do lots of activities uh, such as this, uh, using uh, tick and stick uh, survey. Uh, they also interviewed the, the, the public uh, and uh, uh, coming up, uh, feeling informed and doing the analysis and presenting it to the Think City in terms of findings of the uh, the event or the, the construction of the small spaces. Uh, another activity is assisting the public in feel free to sketch. There are lots of activities happen uh, during that time, such as uh, involving uh, the public uh, and also they are taking care uh, of uh, of the spaces uh, during uh, during the event so it was such a nice activities uh, for our, our students to get involved in uh, during uh, during that period of time and uh, last uh, this uh, into uh, in 2020 last year uh, we also did um, uh, a lot of programs but uh, um, involving a community in a suburban area, urban fringe of uh, KL, uh, 
uh, for a low cost income people, uh, we design communal space, which uh, is also in the category of small spaces in a city. We design communal space, but I, I because of uh, limited time, I, I'm not able to uh, to share with you today. But we, uh, uh, that happens uh, during the pandemic. Uh, therefore, we have to uh, to obey uh, to the strict uh, standard operating procedure uh, of uh, of the activities because uh, they involve we involve uh, with lots of students, and we design uh, the communal spaces for. Uh, uh, for this neighborhood, but the neighborhood, uh, the residential area, uh, are located. Uh, two residential area, they are located very near to KL City Center, so the the, the residents are very happy with the design. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to summarize here: what uh, makes a a, um, a place great in terms of place makings, or what uh, this. Um, uh, project for public space organization uh, have put together uh, in this uh, circle. They must, uh, the, the, the rule is that they must, uh, the, the, the spaces must have users and activity. Without people, that area will be barren, abandoned and so on. Uh, and that space must be comf uh, comfortable and has a certain image. Uh, of course, they must be permeable. They have to have access and linkages and uh, they they can do lots of uh, things uh, in terms of uh, sociability. They, they can attract people uh, uh, together to the spaces, right? So these are being put together. So the the formula, if I would say, the formula to create a great place, especially in urban spaces, uh, for place making. But uh, for me to uh, to summarize this um, uh, this. Uh, uh, this lecture, this sharing, eh, uh, just a, a bit of light sharing uh, with you guys. Uh, uh, a successful pocket gardens and landscape uh, spaces uh, in an urban area, the basic rules are actually uh, for us to make a place or what we call a place making is of course we need to have the space and then we have to have an occasion that we, we are going to utilize there, the, the use and activities. And it has to be functional in design. So landscape architects must remember, the designer must remember, if we want to design, it has to be functional. And without the support from the community, that, uh, that uh, space will not be successful. So it has to have uh, support by the community, the immediate population who are living uh, within the vicinity of the public space so that they can take care of uh, the place or they, they can do the surveillance in terms of um, vandalism or graffiti and so on. But ultimately, that space should be maintained because without maintenance, long-term uh, maintenance and so on, uh, any, uh, any spaces in a city will not be successful. Okay, thank you. With that, um, um, I thank uh, I thank you. I think it's less than one hour, if I'm not mistaken. So um, um, I end the, this lecture with uh, whatever uh, good uh, from this lecture and knowledge that you have gained ca comes from Allah. And uh, for all the weaknesses uh, in this lecture, uh, I uh, I seek apology, not just for my mistake. Yeah? Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Masmina, uh, for the valuable lecture about application of pocket garden and landscape space yeah, in urban context. Uh, uh, before we continue to the next session, uh, uh, please, uh, please uh, for participant who please turn turn off your microphone during uh, the lecture. Uh, understand? Yeah. Yes. Jadi uh, tolong yang partisipan untuk memperhatikan uh, mikrofonnya kalau ada kalau selama uh, uh, kuliah sedang berlangsung ya. Yeah. Yeah. Oke, okay, let's con.
the let's con uh, continue our, uh, the lecture uh, by Dr. Siti Nurhana Ismail. Uh, allow me to describe the brief profile of Dr. Siti Nurhana Ismail to the audience. Uh, uh, in Indonesia, uh, Siti Nurhana Ismail adalah dosen di Department of Landscape Architecture di University Teknologi Malaysia sejak Januari 2021. Uh, sebelumnya beliau pernah menjadi administrative assistant dan tutor di University of Sheffield, Inggris. Uh, dan Dr. Siti Nurhana Ismail telah menempuh pendidikan sarjana di landscape arsitektur di International Islamic University Malaysia dan magister di landscape management University of Sheffield di Inggris dan uh, doktor di landscape University of Sheffield Inggris dengan judul disertasi Rainwater Retention and Eval Transpiration, Transpiration as Affected by Ground Cover Plants The Influence of Leaf Morphology Lingkup bidang riset yang dilakukan beliau diantaranya Urban Green Infrastructure, Urban Ecology, Climate Change Adaptation through Sustainable Approach, Sustainable uh, Water Management, Strategies, and Functional Plans. To Dr. Welcome Dr. Siti Nurhana Ismail. Uh, would you like to start your lecture, please? Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam uh, Chatri, and I would like to extend my uh, gratitude and also thankfulness to um, Itera for inviting me as one of the speakers today. Um, okay, um, I would like to start uh, the um, presentation now. Okay, can you see the presentation? Can you see the slides? Yeah, yes, Dr. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Um, my name is uh, Hana Ismail. Okay, so um, in, in my um, sharing session today, um, I think this will be more on to, um, uh, uh, in, into more detail of the landscape elements as compared to what Prof. Uh, Maslina has um, given the talk about. So my topic of um, uh, my presentation today is on delivering urban ecosystem services. So does plant choice matter? Okay, right. So basically, um, I'll just give a, a brief um, introduction or, on, or definition on what um, uh, um, ecosystem services means. Okay, so um, basically uh, an ecosystem is a group of living things in an area and the way they affect each other and the environment. Okay, so that's like a just a basic definition of what ecosystem means. And the National Geographic also mentioned that an ecosystem is a geographic area where plants, animals, other organisms, as well as the weather and the landscape work together to form like a bubble of life. Okay, so in, in basic definition, it just means that um, the, the people, humans, animals and plants um, and how we um, interact with, with each other and also the environment that we live in. Okay. So um, what about um, ecosystem services? Okay, so when we add the word services, it means that we are obtaining something, okay, from the ecosystem. So what we are obtaining is the benefits. So benefits that humans derive from the ecosystems or the environment, okay? Now, um, basically, um, ecosystem services is categorized into four main categories. The first one is regulating services. So this is basically benefits that we um, gain from regulation of the ecosystem processes, such as climate regulations, flood regulations, and also erosion controls. Okay, the second one is provisional services. So these are goods that we, that we um, gain from the ecosystem, such as food, water, timber, and wood, and, and um, as such. Okay, and then there's the cultural services. So I think this one is, is more, um, I think, relatable to our everyday lives. So this is involving non-material benefits from the ecosystems, such as the spiritual benefits, and then the recreational benefits of, of the ecosystems, and then the aesthetic values of an ecosystem. Okay, and then lastly is the supporting services. So this is um, factors necessary for producing, for producing ecosystem services, such as the nutrient cycles of a plant, and then the oxygen production and also um, primary production. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so these are just examples of um, um, the ecosystems that we have um, in, in our planet or in, in our country or whatever. So uh, for example, like a pond, um, forest, deserts and the ocean. So I'll give an example of, of the ocean. So it's not only just providing habitats for wildlife, uh, for under, underwater wildlife, such as fish and, and corals, but it's also providing, providing like humans um, recreational activities where we go swimming, we go diving um, into the ocean, and we also uh, just appreciate the, the beauty of the, of the ocean. Okay, so that's, that's what I mean by um, ecosystem services. Okay, um, and then um, uh, about um, urban ecosystem services. So I added the word urban ecosystem services because, um, uh, just, just a moment. Okay, um, so basically when, when I add the word ecosystem services, it just uh, basically means the same thing. So the ecosystem services generated by ecosystem within an urban context. Uh, Okay, so, um, so for example, uh, if you look at the, the image on the top right, so this is basically a, a, like a summary photo of what eco, uh, urban ecosystem services is. So it's basically um, different types of, um, I think Dr. Mazina mentioned before, like uh, it's also termed as green infrastructure. Okay, so it's different types of, of, of um, landscape designs, landscape parks, uh, like uh, that uses the natural and uh, natural elements such as trees, uh, grass, lawns, um, even urban forests, and also um, wetlands that are um, put together in an urban area. So it can be in between buildings, it can be um, like a curblet, it can be um, pocket parks. So, so um, this, uh, this um, urban ecosystem uh, services um, can provide uh, benefits to us in terms of um, regulating microclimate. Okay, and then it can also filter noise and air pollution in urban areas. And then it can control um, runoff or um, even urban uh, urban flooding, and then obviously it can provide recreational and also aesthetic values in our um, urban living environment. Okay, so why why is it important? Why is an urban ecosystem service important? Okay, so if you have a look at the uh, the the graph here, so. Basically, um, it's it's a it, now now uh, the urban the world urban population is actually increasing, and the graph here basically shows from nineteen ninety to two thousand and twenty uh, two thousand and nineteen. Sorry, so you can see how the trend is actually increasing on the um, urban world urban population. Okay, so um, in the world today in two thousand twenty, not today uh, last year. The data shows that more than 50% of the urban, uh, the world population is currently residing, residing in urban areas. Okay. And then um, in Malaysia um, itself, um, from it, it, the, 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 the amount is very significant. So it's almost 80% of Malaysian population is residing in urban areas. So this is a very, very large number. Um, so, so we can only imagine if, if like 100% of the population is reside, residing in urban areas. Okay, and then I also looked up Indonesia. So 56% um, of the total of Indonesian population is currently residing in, in um, urban areas. And I'm sure that this uh, is actually increasing by year. Okay, and then what are the effects of um, this increased urban residence? So the effect is increased urbanization. So what is urbanization? So basically um, urbanization uh, means the, um, uh, the, the replacement of natural uh, surfaces into um, cities, into um, um, building, de building developments, into uh, construction of um, impervious surfaces, okay? And then this also results in intensification of carbon emissions. So when urban residents, um, uh, you know, travel around the city centers, uh, we go to work and everything, um, there will be more vehicles that are being used. So this causes in um, increased uh, um, carbon, carbon dioxide um, concentrations in urban areas. And then as a result, which this causes urban heat island effects. So um, if you look at the, the image on the uh, bottom right, so this is the heat, um, urban heat island effect. So this basically means that the temperature in the urban area is actually higher than the temperature than the surrounding um, uh, area or like the or, or the rural areas okay so um, because of this this is actually intensifying the climate change effects so it's causing 
um, uh, higher increase, uh, sorry, increased temperatures is causing more um, urban floodings. Uh, okay, and it's 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 uh, basically intensifying the climate change effects. Okay, so what is our role? Uh, what can we do as as landscape architects? Or actually, I like to call, uh, I like to use the term as landscape people. Uh, Okay, because I, you know, we, we studied landscape architecture, but we don't necessarily become landscape architects. Um, uh, we may become um, other, other professionals in the same industry, such as landscape managers or even landscape researchers. Okay, so one of the things that we can do is to increase awareness and educate the public. Okay, and the reason why I say this is because um, we are we are the people who receive who who have this knowledge who have this information and some of the public may not be aware it doesn't necessarily mean that they are ignorant or they don't want to learn about it it just sometimes means that they don't know where to search for the information so we as landscape architects um, have the say you, you can say the power to actually um, deliver this information and share this knowledge with the public okay and then we as, as um, what landscape architects do, we create, we design, and we develop green spaces, okay, with professional knowledge that we, we have learned throughout um, three or four years, okay, in our lives. And then we also provide sustainable solutions. And by sustainable solutions, I mean um, nature-based solutions, okay? We use na natural elements such as trees, grass, soil to provide environmental, uh, to provide solution for environmental issues, okay? And then uh, we can do landscape research, that, like I mentioned before. And then landscape re research does not only mean that we stay in the landscape uh, field. Field We can also um, collaborate with other fields of expertise, like engineering or medic medicine, medical. Uh, so these um, collaborations will give more impact in, uh, to, to, to the society. Okay, and then obviously we can uh, we we use the uh, we we manage uh, plants for ecological use, and then lastly is we need to choose uh, appropriate plants. Okay. Um, okay, um, I'm not going to go through um, the whole um, of of uh, the list that I mentioned before. I'm just going to give you an example, not not an example. Actually, this is a. Um, just a sharing from my experience. So from my experience when I did my PhD. So I did my PhD at a university in Sheffield, the, so in the UK. So while I was doing my PhD there, I was involved in like a, um, a public engagement uh, event. So this public engagement um, is called the RHS Flower Show. So this is where um, organizations, public or private organizations, institutions and, and companies display anything that is related to landscape. Uh, so it can be products, it can be um, services. OK, so we have something like this in Malaysia. It's called Floria. I'm not sure if you have something like this in, in, in Indonesia. I'm sure you have, but I'm not really aware of them. So um, I'm sorry. And then, um, so basically in uh, my department that I was doing my uh, PhD at, which is the landscape architecture department in, at the University of Sheffield, we, they were involved in designing a garden for climate change, okay? So in this garden, uh, it's, it's basically a garden that, they, uh, that is predicted to look like in the future. So in this garden, they utilize various functional garden features and plants that are resilient to drought and flooding conditions that is caused by climate change. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm trying to say here that the plants here that were used were carefully selected in that they are resilient. They, they don't, uh, you know, if, if they are under um, stress conditions, they, they can strive and, and um, survive the condition. Okay, so and then I was part of the representative from the department, so I was engaging with the public. And then I had many uh, 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 people coming up to me and asking questions um, about, about the, the garden. And then uh, it was really interesting to see how they were genuinely interested. And some of them, no, actually a lot of them didn't know that um, different plants have uh, different functions in that they can provide to the ecosystem, to, uh, to, the, uh, to our ecosystem or the urban ecosystems, okay? So that's, that's what I'm trying to say here, that we, we can uh, educate the public, we can share our knowledge to the public because sometimes they, they want to know, but they don't know where to um, search for the information from, okay? Right, okay, so I mentioned a little about um, functional plants 
so basically, functional plants means uh, 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 means plants that respond to environmental issues, or and influences ecological outcomes. Okay, and then functional plants may also have um, adaptation strategies, whether it be in their leaf, trunk, roots, or canopy, in, in whichever of uh, whichever of their uh, their uh, morphological aspects. And then um, functional plants are usually low maintenance. Okay, so you don't have to water water them regularly. Uh, so it, it just it's just going to be a waste of of uh, resources. And then uh, they also usually have the ability to protect themselves, survive, and thrive during stress. Okay, and then there's also the ecophysiological aspect of a plant, which I'll I'll explain more about that later. And then they are also um, usually resilient plants. Okay. Okay, so examples of how plants can contribute in delivering the urban ecosystem services. So that's you, yes. So plants can help in cooling properties. So like I mentioned before, we have the, the phenomenon of urban heat island effects. So plants can help uh, in cooling our urban, urban environment by um, evaporative cooling. So the cooling of the leaf and the temperatures of the air around the leaf or around the tree itself, okay? And then also with, with by choosing trees that are, um, uh, that have big canopies, uh, the shading from the trees can cool the atmosphere because it intercepts the solar radiation, okay? And then plants can also help with water management or urban um, stormwater management and also reduce the risk of urban flooding. So this, uh, in this um, uh, um, service, plants can help um, intercept or actually capture rainwater and then retain it within their system uh, and then um, the soil that the plant is planted, the, the, the tree is planted in, can also help with um, infiltrating uh, uh, water, uh, storm water runoff, okay? And then plants can uh, also help with noise and air pollution by um, extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And then obviously it can also help with increasing biodiversity, which is one of the things, one of the issues that um, the urban environment is actually facing today, which is the loss of biodiversity. And then um, obviously, again, uh, plants can help with uh, providing recreational areas and uh, providing aesthetics uh, of, of uh, green spaces to the urban residents. So this can help um, directly help with enhancing health and well-being and also mental health and then um, improving quality of lives. Okay, um, so okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna choose one of the services that um, plants can actually help, uh, which is on the roles of plant types in stormwater management. So this is because I'm I'm choosing this um, as compared to the others because I will be relating this to my PhD research that I did a um, couple of years back. Okay, so basically, if you have a look at this, uh, this image here or this diagram here, it shows the water cycle of, of vegetation, okay? So when um, rainfall falls onto um, a tree canopy, um, it is intercepted by the tree canopies, okay? So this is called um, canopy interception. So this is influenced by the density of the canopy, the leaf type, um, the, the, the branch type and, and um, also the, the type of um, rainfall characteristics itself, okay? So, um, so, so a lot of the um, rainfall is captured within the canopy, but those that did not um, retained, that is not retained in the canopy, um, then falls off and, which, and they are either intercepted into the soil system or they flow as runoff, okay? So this is what we call runoff or stormwater runoff or surface runoff, okay? So it basically means, it basically means water that flows along um, pavements or impervious surfaces that cannot be infiltrated into the soil, okay? And then some of the portion of the water that is retained within the canopy is used by the plants for photosynthesis. And then some of the uh, water is lost through transpiration or evapotranspiration. Okay, um, I'll just uh, give a brief introduction of what evapotranspiration means. I'm not sure if, if some of you are aware. Um, basically, um, evapotranspiration is the process of evaporation and also transpiration. So transpiration is solely by the plant and evaporation may be by the um, plant leaf surface or from the soil. Okay, so it's the combined effect of 
uh, moisture loss from a plant system. So, so, so the cycle goes like it is intercepted within the plant, it's retained um, for, a, for some period of time, and then it is lost back into the atmosphere through this process called evapotranspiration. Okay, so, sorry. So uh, this is one of the uh, plant's functional key features, okay? And uh, it's important because it basically, when they intercept the, the rainwater, it stores, it has like a storage within the system before it, it, it basically loses back the moisture into the atmosphere, okay? And then uh, this um, evapotranspiration um, process is, again, dependent on various physical and physiological aspects, such as the root system, leaf size, leaf um, canopy characteristics, and even the microclimatic um, conditions surrounding the, the uh, plant or the tree, okay? It's a very complex uh, mechanism uh, because I studied this in, in my PhD, and, but, I, don't, but I, I won't be um, uh, giving any, any more elaboration on this because uh, maybe this requires a, a different um, lecture maybe in, in the future. Okay, so, and then there's the ecophysiology of plants. So basically ecophysiology means how plants perform, evolves and adapts to its natural environment, okay? Like um, temperature, wind, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations, and plants tend to adapt or make physiological adjustments based on their nature of origin, okay? So <laughs> I'll give you an example for like, um, tropical plants. Um, tropical plants can usually withstand warm and humid climates because that's where their origins um, are. Okay, and then they are usually um, also able to re uh, to uh, withstand well moisture conditions or wet leaves. Okay, as compared to um, plants that are often grown in desert or arid zones. These plants are um, dependent on very infrequent rainfall because of the nature of the desert, okay? And they are usually accustomed to being drought tolerant, okay? Um, the same with um, alpine plants. So alpine plants are basically plants that are usually grown in rocky mountains, mountain areas. So these plants, these types of plants are usually exposed to a colder climate with high winds and snow and even frost and also high light levels because uh, they are usually grown in like mountain areas, okay? So these type of plants are usually easily adapted to high amount of moisture and can also survive in drought. So they are uh, more resilient in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, withstanding extreme conditions, okay? Now, okay, so this is what I did for my PhD study. So I looked at the roles of different plant uh, type or leaf type of different plant species and how they can contribute to um, reducing um, stormwater runoff. Okay, so the so in in my research, I had um, six different species that I looked at, and um, each of them are categorized into three different um, leaf categories or leaf type categories. So if you have a look at the the two two um, photos on the left side, so these plants are more um, they have like a narrow leaf type, narrow leaf shape. Um, they look like needles or like grass. So, uh, so that's, um, I call this like needle shaped uh, leaves. And then the middle uh, photos uh, are plants that have broad leaf shapes, okay? Uh, and then the, the, one, the, the two on the right um, are plants that have many um, small leaf shapes, okay? Which also then forms um, very dense canopy, okay? So in my experiment, the plants were exposed to natural rainfall. And then the retention performance was obtained or retention, uh, when I say retention, I mean um, the, the, the rainfall that is captured by the, the, by the plant and then that is retained within the canopy, okay? So the retention performance was obtained by weighing each plant, okay? And then any weight gain from the pot um, is assumed to be rainfall retention within, in the system and any weight loss is assumed to be due to evapotranspiration or transpiration, okay? So I also captured like a slow motion video of, of how um, rainfall impacted on uh, the leaf types, okay? So basically here is examples of the three um, leaf categories. So um, if you look at uh, the, the photo on the far left on um, Virginia cordifolia, the plant, um, the water is retained on the surface until it became heavy and saturated. And then it forms like a pool or a puddle on the leaf itself. 
and then it sheds off because the leaf is becoming heavier. Okay. Uh, and then the middle picture, the middle photo, um, large droplets impacting on um, small leaf type. So this is causing more splashing effects. Okay. And then this um, result in um, more droplets come uh, dripping off from the canopy and then falling in between the gaps between, between the leaves. Okay. And then lastly, it's uh, the droplet impact on uh, plants that have narrow leaves. Now, this species had high, very high hydrophobic leaf traits. So it means that it repels water. Okay, it does it. So water basically forms like a, like a bubble and then it just um, um, flows off. But um, it's, it, it was found that water was held within the leaf angles and causes multi-layer interception. Um, okay, so as a result from my, um, from my study, um, it was found that my uh, the, the 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 leaf morphology or leaf uh, a certain leaf type actually played in a, an important role. So the two um, plant species that had like narrow leaf types um, actually retained the highest amount of moisture compared to the rest of the species. So this basically shows that in some way um, leaf morphology or the shape of the leaf actually plays an important role. Why? Because um, uh, it was found that droplets access deeper into the into into the soil because of the shape, uh, which is um, it's it's narrow and it's facing upwards. So it, it allows rainwater to um, intercept deeper into the into the um, canopy. Okay, and because the the these plants have very dense canopy, and um, it also allows for uh, more retention capabilities. Okay. On the other hand, um, the two plants on the right is uh, retain the least amount of moisture. And here we can see that it is not consistent in terms of the leaf shape, leaf shape because um, hosta uh, the, uh, is the plant with, with broad leaf and then uh, Pakistandra terminalis is plants with um, very, very small leaves, but it's also um, uh, forming a dense canopy. Okay, so then here I looked further into what could be the reason to why um, uh, it is not retaining as much uh, as the other species. So then this is where the ecophysiological aspects of uh, is coming. Uh, it uh, comes in. Okay, so for example, if you see the hosta plant, although it has a um, broad leaf, the texture of the leaf is very highly hydrophobic. So it repels water. So water, any water that falls onto the leaf, it just rolls off. Okay. So it's not just uh, about the leaf shape. There's we can, we have to look into the leaf texture as well. Okay. And then about Pakisandra, this plant, although it's it's very um, dense in canopy, it is naturally um, grown in um, shaded area. Okay. So the is ecophysiological aspect of this plant is that it is often grown under bigger trees. So it's, it, it doesn't um, really withstand stress of, of droughts, okay? Because my experiment, it was uh, the, the plants were all exposed to natural conditions for um, 44 days. So I did not uh, give them any watering during the experiment. So it was exposed to droughts for uh, like no rain for, uh, for almost a week. So this plant, uh, this Pakistanta plant, it didn't really show resilience okay so it uh, as a result many of the species uh, many of this uh, plant actually died during my experiment so it shows that um, this plant is is not as resilient compared to other uh, the other plants that i observed okay so um, okay i'm just going to go through briefly about the key findings of my research so it, it we need to identify plants that are resilient okay in my research in my case i looked into drought and water logging tolerance okay and then we also, uh, functional plants should not be identified based on um, morphological aspects alone. So, um, so like I said, uh, the inconsistency between leaf type suggests that other factors such as um, the ecophysiological aspects and also um, the leaf texture, uh, even the surrounding microclimatic conditions during the rainfall or during um, uh, the drying process is important. Um, is important to be taken into consideration other than just plant shape or, or the leaf shape alone. Okay. And then although this research suggests that narrow leaf species are more effective to 
to help mitigate urban storm water runoff. The roles of other leaf trees can also be beneficial in other in different significant levels. Okay, because in reality, we need to vary our um, the types of plant species that we choose to uh, be implemented in our in our parks or green infrastructures to provide the best and the most resilient um, ecosystem services. Okay, and then finally. Um, understanding different plants' physiological behavior is the key to evaluating the importance of plants' functional traits in relation to ecosystem services. So this is what I mean by um, when uh, landscape architects um, uh, design a park, uh, the, the choice of plants that you want to choose, uh, it needs to be, um, you would say, smart, okay? Because we don't, we don't want to just, um, you know, plant whatever we feel uh, it looks. It looks beautiful, but it doesn't serve the the functional uh, uh, aspect, okay? Okay, so this is me um, during my uh, my PhD experiment. So this is just basically what my um, experiment looked like. Uh, so these are my the different species uh, or the different plants that I use, which were exposed to natural climatic conditions. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to give just one uh, brief example of, of um, plants or, or a project that used um, functional plants. Okay, so this project is called um, Grey to Green Project, which was... Um, Done in which was done in Sheffield, uh, the the place that I was um, that I studied at. So um, I know the person who designed this, but I wasn't involved in the project at all. So basically, this project is um, is a such project. So such project means um, sustainable urban drainage system project. So the main purpose of the project is actually to help slow down surface runoff in the area that is usually prone to flooding. So this area that this project is uh, built on is usually um, uh, usually um, uh, have flooding occurrences, um, okay? So the main thing about this, this project is that uh, water from outside flows into uh, where the plants are, okay? It's, which is called a swale and rain gardens. And then water that is captured within the system is used to support plantings uh, in the landscape. So it basically reduces the need for uh, maintenance, okay? So the, the uh, um, landscape managers or even whoever who, who is in charge of, of maintaining the space does not need to um, always um, uh, irrigate the, the plants, okay? And then uh, the, the plants that were used were carefully selected and then it used uh, drought tolerant plantings. And then the the park, or I wouldn't say park, is the, the because this is like um, a project that was that extends to different part of of the city. Okay, so uh, this also had multifunctional benefits, other multifunctional benefits. So it increases urban biodiversity and creates wildlife corridor by um, adding uh, diverse plant species. Okay, so again, it uses different plant species with different functional abilities. And then it protects pedestrian, uh, pedestrians from air pollution by using multi-legged plantings. It helps in urban cooling by increasing tree planting and it treats contaminated wet, wet water, as well as promoting health and well-being um, of the urban residents in this area. Okay, you can look, you can, you can um, look this project uh, in Google and just uh, if you want to know more about it. Okay, so this is um, some other photos of the projects that of the gray to green project. Um, so basically you can have a look that it uses, it, 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 um, uses different um, uh, tree species, some of which are very colorful, um, some of which are uh, just narrow, like, like grass, like grass looking. Uh, so basically the diversity also helps in the resilience of the system and while also increasing um, biodiversity uh, of, of the landscape, okay? Um, okay, I think um, that's it for me. I'm just going to conclude my um, session today by um, with, with like a short note. So, uh, it is important for landscape architects to to understand and and um, be aware of the scientific knowledge behind uh, choosing plant species. Okay, and we need to know how plants function, their characteristics, and 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 also their functioning to the ecosystem benefits. Okay, because if, if not us, who else is going to provide this type of information? 
okay and then it's not while it is uh, we we want to like see beautiful uh, landscape and beautiful parks but it's not all just about that we need to have resilience and um, and um, sustainability in our parks especially today when we are facing with um, crisis like um, climate change and global warming so um, our role in um, as landscape architects is actually important in in helping to tackle uh, this this um, climate change and global warming issues okay so that what we will provide to to the society is not only benefic beneficial to us, but it's also um, useful and beneficial to wildlife, animals, the environment, and even um, our planet. Okay, so I think I will end my session today. Thank you very much for your time and your um, for being here to listen to, 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 to this talk. I hope um, what I have uh, shared here has uh, given um, some, some information, some useful information. And uh, yes, I, I pass now to Miss um, Madam Tapti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siti Nurhana Ismail. Uh, thank you for giving us a valuable lecture about delivering urban ecosystem service that's plan choice matter. Uh, allow me to summarize your uh, part of your lecture to the audience in Indonesia. Jadi, uh, dari hasil uh, kuliah dari Dr. Maslina Mansor uh, bahwa sebenarnya tipologi public space uh, apa, sudah ada kategori pengkategorian yang terdiri atas skala makro hingga mikronya sedangkan kalau yang itu dipertimbangkan berdasarkan green amenity, communal space dan public realms. Dan sini kalau uh, kalau kita pengkategorian uh, ruang publik mikronya itu dikategorikan lagi lebih kecil lagi yaitu terdiri atas ruang terbuka publik yang ter, eh, contohnya seperti padang plaza alun-alun eh, yang kedua ada pocket garden yang ketiga kategori ketiga linear dan keempat parklet eh, atau carplet yang belum eh, ada eh, padanan katanya kalau di sini dan eh, kesuksesan ruang publik itu tidak hanya terbatas dari estetika saja jadi estetika pun dilihat secara spasial jadi dari elemen elemen material softscape hardscape struktur elemen air dan landform atau pembentukan tanahnya dan sini pemilihan penilaian itu mengikuti prinsip bentuk warna dan tekstur yang eh, desain itu disesuaikan dengan eh, bentuk lahan yang kecil dan terbatas dan juga mempertimbangkan fungsinya juga dan di sini kita bisa tahu dari kesimpulan dari kuliah dokter Maslina bahwa eh, ruang publik eh, kecil sekalipun itu uh, harus memiliki uh, nilai tidak hanya nilai estetik tapi juga uh, memiliki nilai ekologi bisa ber menjadi uh, spons atau area hijau yang bernilai ekologi dan juga uh, fungsi ter, uh, kebutuhan dari uh, memenuhi kebutuhan dari pengguna tersebut untuk kepentingan publik sehingga dapat menjadikan uh, public realm yang lebih hidup dan uh, uh, jadi menjadi sebuah place uh, uh, jadi ruang publik itu uh, jadi Place yang memiliki nilai dan makna untuk uh, kepentingan publik. Dan di sini juga ada contoh uh, pekerjaan uh, proyek yang dilakukan dengan melibatkan mahasiswa dan uh, pengguna di sekitarnya. Dan untuk uh, kuliah dari Dr. Siti Nurhana, uh, kita bisa tahu kalau ekosistem itu memberikan nilai regulasi kebutuhan pokok berupa bisa berupa air makanan kayu dan juga ada nilai budayanya bisa beri, contohnya seperti spiritual dan rekreasi dan ada nilai pendukungnya jadi bisa memberikan kontribusi untuk siklus nutrisi oksigen dan di kota sendiri karena pertumbuhan penduduk yang tinggi akhirnya membuat masalah terutama tentang air ya jadi banyaknya permukaan tanah pembangunan yang tidak mempertimbangkan penyerapan air 
sehingga sebagai landscape arsitek kita tidak hanya landscape arsitek yang desain tapi juga memberikan nilai edukasi dan memberikan solusi berkelanjutan untuk uh, uh, tidak hanya uh, penduduk sekitar apa pengguna apa publik tapi juga untuk uh, ekosistem itu sendiri untuk mereka sendiri dan sini uh, beliau juga memberikan sebuah fungsi salah satu apa, salah satu uh, pemilihan uh, faktor yang harus diperhatikan adalah uh, pemilihan tanamannya seperti apa jadi uh, kan uh, pemilihan tanaman ada yang berdasarkan untuk sebagai fungsi penyejuk mengatasi banjir polusi udara atau untuk uh, habitat dan juga rekreasi estetika dan di sini uh, dia juga mem- memfokuskan bahwa peran tanaman dalam manajemen air limpasan. Jadi air limpasan, air yang jatuh uh, ke permukaan uh, uh, perkasan itu tidak kalau uh, berbeda dengan uh, jatuhnya air ke perkasan dengan berbeda dengan uh, jatuhnya air ke tanaman. Jadi air yang jatuh ke tanaman itu ada ada yang diserap atau difiltrasi dan di evapotranspiration atau di menguap gitu dan di sini juga beliau ke, me, 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 memberi memberi apa menjelaskan tentang disertasinya tentang kategori tanaman yang tahan terhadap uh, air apa uh, trans, eva itu yang menjadi fokusnya dari sisi morfologinya yaitu dengan menghitung berat dari tanaman itu Jadi kalau di berat itu dilihat dari filtrasinya dengan mana yang semakin berat itu berarti filtrasinya air semakin banyak. Sedangkan kalau dia lebih ringan itu berarti ada pengurangan berat dari elva transportasinya. Dan sini dari hasil penelitiannya didapatkan bahwa pemilihan tanaman tidak hanya dari segi apa yang tahan terhadap air limpasan itu tidak hanya dilihat dari morfologi daunnya bentuk daunnya saja tidak hanya itu tapi juga ada pengaruh ekopsikologikalnya jadi misalkan bentuk daunnya tidak hanya dilihat dari bentuk daunnya apa, tidak ternyata tidak ter, tapi juga ternyata dilihat juga dari tekstur daun itu jadi spesies tanaman jadi untuk jadi saran dari beliau adalah spesies tanaman itu harus ditang, apa, dipilih dengan bervariasi untuk meningkatkan uh, biodiversity yang menilai, memiliki nilai biodiversity yang tinggi uh, apa kenaikan keanekaragaman hayati yang tinggi yang dan juga yang fungsi fungsional gitu dan tidak hanya bernilai estetik semata dan juga di uh, Sekian dari yang uh, summary yang saya bisa buat. Uh, and then, uh, let's continue the next session. Uh, for this, uh, we will go to the next uh, discussion session. For this discussion session, uh, let's start with the three questions first uh, from the participant. And we prioritize priorities uh, participant who ask directly, followed by participant who ask through chat. And here we have Safmi Sukmana, you want to ask to Dr. Maslina. Uh, Dr. Saf- Safmi Sukmana, can you turn on your uh, mic to ask directly to Dr. Maslina? Hello? It looks like uh, she doesn't. Okay, then uh, we'll continue to the uh, question from the chat. Uh, we have uh, Rosi, Rosi Damayanti. Mrs. Rosi Damayanti is a lecture, lecturer from uh, Institute Pertanian Bogor. Uh, she asks about who does join to take care project activities and how it was conducted. Uh, Ms. Dr. Maslina Mansor, uh, can you would you like to uh, answer the question? Uh, 
thank you very much, Madam uh, Moderator, uh, and also thank you for the question. Uh, I think the the, the question is uh, how uh, uh, is talking about the project that I've shown, uh, the the sample of project that I've shown uh, uh, in the slide presentation uh, on the. Uh, on the uh, parklet and curblet uh, projects uh, uh, done uh, in carried out in 2018 uh, in uh, in the event called World uh, World Open Forum Nine. Um, that one um, uh, during the the events uh, the event took place uh, I think in February uh, 2018. But in order to prepare for that event, the event is uh, quite, uh, there are a variety of programs happen uh, during uh, uh, the duration of the events. And uh, mostly uh, the, the programs, the smaller program, uh, the variety of programs such as talk and so on and so forth, uh, for the landscape spaces, um, variety of uh, universities uh, involved uh, in in uh, in the program, but for uh, IUM, uh, Think City approach us uh, uh, to uh, uh, to us to seek the help of our students uh, to do a, a survey on the public views, uh, public's opinion on the spaces that they have uh, constructed and uh, provided uh, during the event. So what uh, what we did was that uh, we attached uh, the, uh, the event, uh, the, the event activities uh, together with a, uh, a studio project, uh, a small scale. It, it is just a very quick uh, exercise uh, within three weeks time uh, uh, for the participation of the studio, our studio, uh, our design uh, studio, we call it uh, Urban Design Studio. Uh, what uh, we did was that um, we prepared, um, uh, once uh, the we got information about the types of uh, spaces uh, that we need to survey, uh, we provide uh, Think City and DBKL, DBKL is the city municipality, uh, provided in terms of survey questions that are, what uh, you see in the presentation, the, the very, uh, very brief uh, format of uh, questionnaire uh, actually uh, came from uh, our students after they brainstorm uh, what they need to ask. And then that, uh, that survey is quite special because it's uh, called Tick and Tick, uh, Tick and uh, 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 Tick and Tick survey. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, since they are approaching, uh, uh, they need to approach uh, the public very quickly. The survey questions need to be uh, very uh, short and concise. So what we did was that we prepared uh, the survey questions uh, and the design uh, for it. And uh, we presented to the client. The client is the uh, Think City and also the DBKL uh, on what they need. And we, uh, we uh, presented the activities that we can participate uh, uh, and provide uh, them during the event, the two, uh, if I'm not mistaken, two weeks time, two weeks uh, event. Uh, so uh, the so the, our students uh, became the enumerators, uh, the uh, uh, what we call the uh, people who ask uh, the, the the public about uh, uh, the activity uh, about the, the the provisions of the public spaces. Uh, there were five. Uh, public set, uh, spaces, one is at the square and uh, two uh, at the parklet and two at the uh, curblet that you have seen in, in the slide before. Uh, when uh, the event took place, the students uh, every day will go in terms of activity, they will uh, go from morning uh, taking turn. Uh, in the studio, we have uh, uh, around 30 uh, students. So uh, we uh, did a grouping uh, for uh, students to take care of the five uh, spaces, uh, event spaces. So um, they have their schedule rot rotations uh, from morning until night, uh, 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 when they have to be on the spot or, or on the space, because that uh, space need to be taken off, uh, take, taken care of uh, throughout the, the days and night. Uh, and uh, they need to approach uh, public who pass by 
uh, the areas uh, to survey them uh, using that uh, survey form, as well as uh, uh, having these uh, sticky notes uh, uh, for them to uh, write down any uh, any any wish that they have uh, for the city, uh, for the public. So that will be uh, uh, the the techniques. Uh, that were the technique that they uh, they use uh, for that event. And another thing is they uh, interview uh, the party uh, the the public uh, in terms of uh, their feelings, uh, the environment uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur City during that time. Because of course when uh, we uh, when the uh, the when DBKL and uh, Think City provided the spaces. Of course, uh, during that time, uh, the the spaces, uh, uh, the environment in Kuala Lumpur City uh, are quite vibrant. They were, were quite uh, quite uh, vibrant and active. Uh, uh, so uh, we asked uh, the uh, the public on how they feel about that kind of environment. So basically what I can summarize in terms of uh, our students' participation is that uh, uh, during the event, uh, they had three types of activity, uh, four types of activity. First is uh, uh, doing the survey. Uh, second is um, helping the public uh, to, uh, to uh, involved in sketching and uh, stick, uh, sticking their opinion on the boards uh, uh, on the side. Uh, thirdly, doing the interview, that interview will, will turn into video, uh, a video presentation. I think uh, if you want to uh, view in detail the activities that happen, I think uh, things, uh, if you uh, open uh, YouTube, uh, you can view it. Uh, if you type Think City WUF9, uh, I, I think that event uh, will still be there. So you can see the activities. There are various, actually, uh, uh, what we did is just a small part of activities that happened during uh, uh, the whole uh, event, the month of uh, February. Um, and um, the fourth is uh, they are taking care. They were taking care of the, the spaces so that um, uh, they know uh, uh, they, uh, they did the observation uh, in terms of uh, their own um, uh, their own survey of the site. So uh, after after we collected the forms, uh, the students came back to the studio, and then they analyzed the the data that they obtained from the uh, from the survey form, uh, from the interview. They turned the interview into a video, and they did the survey. Uh, they 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 put they analyzed it a uh, very uh, basic analysis technique using Excel. Uh, uh, and they put it in terms of percentage of um, responses. And after we uh, got the findings, uh, we presented uh, the whole findings to uh, to Think City as uh, uh, findings uh, for the events uh, um, focusing on these uh, five spaces. Okay, I hope um, I answered the question from uh, Ms. Roshi. Thank you, uh, yeah. the former Selina Mansa, yeah. for uh, giving us uh, answer for it. Uh, let's go next go to the next question from uh, Safni Sukmana. She wants to ask directly. Uh, Safni Sukmana, silakan membuka mic-nya. Thank, thank you very much, Bu Safni. Can you hear my voice? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you for the opportunity given. Uh, I have some questions to Ibu Maslina Mansur and Ibu Siti Nurhana. So first is for Ibu Maslina Mansur. So there are three questions. I don't know whether uh, my question is already covered by the previous uh, uh, participant who asked the question because I just got back from the uh, you know, uh, internet connection problem. So the first question is, uh, this is very interesting actually when you talk about the pocket gardens and in here, well actually I'm, I'm Shafni once again and I'm a practitioner in garden design and construction but I'm not a, a landscape architect, uh, just a landscape people just like you see Nurhana uh, mentioned before and I'm living in Yogyakarta right now. 
So it seems like pocket garden is not yet very common uh, in, in our cities in Indonesia in terms of uh, usable uh, pocket gardens. Well, we have gardens uh, usually in, in, the, in the median of the street, for example, or at the curb uh, of the street, but it's, it's not usable. It's just for you know, static and view appeal, just like that. So my question is, uh, in Malaysia, Malaysian context, this pocket garden is already a common thing. Can we see uh, pocket gardens in the cities of Malaysia? And uh, if yes, then how is the management and the maintenance of those uh, pocket gardens? Because in my my uh, in my view, pocket gardens should be provided by local governments, I think, and, and there must be uh, some level of management and uh, maintenance that should be uh, performed to, uh, to to be able that the garden can uh, have a, a good performance for people. And then the second one is you mentioned about the, the case studies of, uh, of the spaces designed by the students, correct? Yes, and uh, they also performed a survey after the gardens is established. And so this is a kind of POE, in my opinion, a post occupancy evaluation. And uh, yes, and my question is is it also a common practice in your country that POE is also performed or established after you know, um, public space is, is constructed or established? Because I think we here, we don't do something like that. And usually a garden is constructed, built, and then after that, uh, they don't really care about how people use that or, uh, or people don't use that. And then the third one, we have quite intensive uh, problem with vandalism. Uh, do you also have uh, the same problem with vandalism? If not, then how did the you know, Malaysian government or local government better uh, handle that vandalism problem. Okay. So that's for uh, Ibu Maslina Mansur, and then the second one is for Ibu Siti Nurhana. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, Bu Siti Nurhana is a plant person, plant researcher, and I'm a plant person as well. And Sheffield is not a, a strange uh, place for me, because we have uh, also uh, activity together in Melbourne at the time uh, with the program of uh, Woody Meadow project. And so uh, my, uh, there are three questions as well. So the first is um, how far is the implementation of uh, bioretention system in the cities in Malaysia? It's just like rain garden and bioswale, just like you mentioned. Because once again, I think it's, it's not very common yet in, in our country here. So we want to see how far uh, the implementation and the application of those technologies uh, in, in, in your country. And then the second question is um, about native and exotic species of plants uh, used in, in the cities in, in, in the world. Uh, we know uh, in the changing climate, uh, just like what you mentioned, uh, native species is all, uh, sometimes is not relevant anymore because the climate is changing. So the native uh, species cannot cope with the changing climate. So uh, people have to introduce new exotic plants. Well, at the other hand, the native species is is uh, viewed as the most adapt adaptive uh, species uh, for the local environment. So how do you see that? Because I, I still see that some cities are still like uh, strong in, in holding uh, perception that native is the best, while others start to introduce the exotic species in the cities. And the, the third and the final one is, is there any good uh, res resources you know, uh, in terms of plants that we can, we can use as uh, you know, landscape people or landscape architect in terms of you know, plant selection uh, especially the, uh, the resources or database that provide the characteristics or, or the traits of each of the plant species that we can use that as a consideration when we design uh, landscape or garden in, in urban context. 
So that's all my question. Thank you very much for the responses. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, yeah. um, thank you, uh, Brother Shafni, yeah, for, for your questions. Yeah. You have three questions for me. Inshallah, I try to uh, answer it as much as possible. Okay, for the first question, you're, you're asking about uh, the pocket gardens. Uh, are they available, uh, common eh, in, uh, in uh, Malaysia? I can, uh, I can tell in the context of Kuala Lumpur City. Uh, nowadays, uh, currently, uh, there are more and more um, uh, 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 efforts uh, being taken uh, uh, in terms of uh, providing those uh, pocket uh, spaces and land or landscape spaces uh, that I mentioned before. There are uh, quite a few types of them uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, city center. For example, uh, the improving the revitalization of streetscape, uh, pedestrian malls, uh, usually in a form of um, uh, paving uh, materials, uh, nice, very colorful uh, paving material that we can see in Bukit Bintang, uh, and also mural painting. Uh, that is one of the, uh, I think, one of the best, uh, one of the quick solutions uh, to beautify uh, the town center or the uh, city center besides having plants because of the limited uh, spaces. So we have uh, that more and more, I think in a big uh, big city such as in Johor Bahru, in uh, Penang as well. But those, uh, uh, those kind of uh, projects uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, be successful without the involvement of uh, the municipality, yeah? the city municipality such as Dewan Bandaraya Kuala Lumpur uh, and others uh, located in, in the different state. But, uh, um, uh, we also have the uh, the, the, the NGOs, yeah, non-government agency. Uh, if they are very active, then they are helping in uh, giving ideas um, and then uh, proposing it to the BKL so that uh, they can work together. That's why uh, one of the one of the most active uh, um, uh, organizations uh, in our country is uh, Think City. Yeah, that they involve a lot in. Uh, in uh, projects uh, focusing on placemaking in uh, urban areas, uh, for example, in Kuala Lumpur, they, they concentrated in three areas, Kuala Lumpur, Penang, and Johor Bahru, if I'm not mistaken, and Malacca, four, 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 uh, four areas. Yeah? So they did a lot of uh, efforts in providing, uh, uh, in uh, giving awareness to the public about the importance of these uh, small spaces. And um, uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, there is more and more uh, of those uh, uh, public uh, spaces, uh, small public spaces appearing in uh, in the city in Malaysia. Um, on the issue of maintenance and man management, of course, that will become the hardest issue anywhere. And uh, that takes a lot of responsibility. Uh, usually, uh, uh, the people who are managing it are the mun municipality. Uh, enforcement is a is a must in terms of uh, uh, giving fine uh, for for people who are littering or uh, 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 or doing vandalism or graffiti or uh, it, there should be uh, uh, an enforcement and that becomes the our weakness i think not only in kuala lumpur but uh, in uh, in in other countries especially in developing countries uh, if i can uh, if if i can say Okay, um, but so far we can see improvement in terms of um, in terms of uh, this enforcement in in uh, in Kuala Lumpur because of uh, the 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 efforts to beautify uh, to achieve uh, the Garden City as aspired by our previous Prime Minister and so on, and to make sure uh, uh, for tourism attraction uh, in the city center besides having a new town such as uh, Putrajaya built. Uh, that become our role model as a garden city for Malaysia. And um, okay, that one is uh, for the first question. The second question you're talking about, uh, you're asking about this, uh, uh, the event, eh, WUF9, uh, is it in post-occupancy uh, evaluation? Um, uh, it's uh, actually, uh, it's um, uh, post-occupancy evaluation is a, uh, is a uh, taking a, a long time for us to assess it, but that one is actually uh, being 
uh, constructed uh, with the effort of uh, Think City and other organization body. Uh, they construct it very quickly and uh, for the purpose of that event. And when the public use it, uh, our students will survey their, 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 their opinion about it. So I, I, I would say that it's not a post-occupancy evaluation. It's more like a, uh, their, uh, uh, their views about that design, uh, whether it is suitable, whether they, they like it to have it uh, in the city, uh, scattered around in the city or something like that. So I, I should say that it's not a post-occupancy evaluation. Um, uh, is uh, the post-occupancy evaluation common? Um, I, for personally, I'm not sure this is from my knowledge. Uh, no. Yeah, usually, uh, of course, we design and after that, uh, we did not do this uh, audit, yeah, um, audit uh, of uh, uh, whether the the uh, the space is functional or not, uh, whether it is uh, uh, successful uh, in the long term. Uh, but um, in terms of uh, there are few uh, small um, efforts that being carried out by academicians, yeah, academics. Uh, for example, in UIA, we have this uh, center for audit, audit for accessibility uh, in a, a public places, in a buildings, uh, in, a, in our architecture department. Uh, those um, uh, institute or, or those center, they will uh, do research uh, audit of the uh, the public places uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in KL, so they will their research finding will inform the authorities and what uh, what uh, in terms of what uh, they should improve. I think that's uh, uh, that's uh, is a, an effort uh, uh, by people who are aware of uh, the conditions of the existing. Uh, public uh, spaces in uh, in our uh, in in the in the, in our urban area, uh, but uh, that is not common. Yeah, the post occupancy uh, evaluation. Okay, on the third question, I was talking about vandalism. Yeah, sure, vandalism happens uh, all the time. Uh, last time when we did uh, this uh, uh, program, yeah, when we uh, involved in this activity uh, in the World Urban Forum program. Uh, even though when the students uh, took care, uh, taking turn uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, taking care of the five spaces, happens. Uh, it happens when we lost like a, a landscape element, landscape plantings there, the benches are going somewhere else, and so on and so forth. That is the that is the nature of uh, when people uh, um, are not having this. Um, uh, are not uh, uh, being um, uh, educated uh, individually in terms of uh, uh, taking care of uh, of the environment. So that one, uh, that one is in terms of awareness, and we have to look at the uh, many external factors, uh, social issues, for example, like gelandangan uh, uh, or the homeless people. Most of them concentrated in the city center, especially in the old parts. Uh, uh, because of, um, I think the trend of migra migration, the local peoples now, uh, usually in the city center, in the old parts of city center, when they have business, the Chinese people, the Malay people, and the Indian people in Kuala Lumpur city center, uh, they had business uh, in the town, uh, in the old parts of town. But once they become older, they are, they are, they are their generation, their children would not like to take the business. So they, because they have their own profession, they have their own jobs and so on. So they are living at the suburban area or uh, in the urban fringe or uh, in other states. So if, um, if uh, and later when this, uh, uh, the parents uh, are very old, they are not, um, um, it's not possible for them to take care of the places. So they rent it to, uh, people who migrate from outside to the uh, 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 to the town center. So it's become a different set of um, a set of uh, people who doesn't have um, a, a sense of belonging to that place. So the the uh, those kind of uh, relationships uh, influence how they take care of 
uh, their neighborhood and uh, their home. So I think that's uh, that relates with a, a sense of belongings, uh, uh, place attachment, attachment to our own uh, place. So that what's happened in the old parts of Kuala Lumpur because uh, the the uh, the local peoples migrating out and uh, the unknown people that we don't know, um, maybe the workers, uh, the uh, the the new people yeah, uh, coming in uh, and they don't have sense of belonging. So the, the sense of taking care of that environment is not there in terms of cleanliness, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, this uh, vandalism. So I think that's uh, that's uh, it's only my assumption. We need to do research more about this. <laughs> but um, social and demographic issues around the, the face of the city. Yes, it, yeah. mm -hmm. it relates with the social demography as well and uh, the social characteristic of that area. Uh, I think the most important thing about this issue on vandalism and so on is about the eye on the street and uh, the, the sense of belongings, uh, people, uh, people surveillance on the street. If we have more people using the space, uh, uh, meaning that uh, uh, more people would, would um, unlikely to do bad things to the space, right? I, I hope it... Uh, uh, the quest, uh, the, the an it answers your, your your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Shafni. Um, okay. Um, hi. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Um, Shafni Sukma. Thank you for your questions. Okay. Uh, so your first question is: How far is the Im implementation of um, bioretention strategies or stormwater strategies in Malaysia? Right. Okay. So, and you said that in, in Indonesia, um, currently there's not much is being done um, on this. So, um, okay. In in Malaysia, I know um, as far as I'm I'm, I'm concerned because um, to be honest, I, I just came back to Malaysia from Sheffield last year. So I I've been living in Sheffield for about six years. So I'm not really aware of of the the current situation in Malaysia. But as far as I am concerned, um, research. Uh, the research on on this on on the the importance of green infrastructures in the in terms of um, stormwater management is currently like booming. So so what I mean by that is that more and more research is actually um, um, coming up uh, in from um, from Malaysian perspective, and um, I know and. And I know that, like for example, like rain gardens are being being um, implemented in in certain areas, and most of most is um, being being implemented in residential areas. That's as far as I know. But in terms of like um, this um, stormwater management strategies being implemented in um, so, um, a larger right. scale, in a larger scale or like a like a regional park. I, I don't think it's it's being conducted yet and and like you said in in, in Malaysia is still um, something that needs to be um, taken into into serious consideration considering Malaysia is is uh, cities in Malaysia do have um, um, severe flooding of um, urban flooding um, problems okay um, uh, and and um, I know that green infrastructures is also uh, the, the, the use of green infrastructures is also, is also increasing uh, in, in implementation in Malaysia for example um, from what I can see um, like um, green walls um, and even wetlands so those those are things that in a way contributes to um, uh, reducing risk of flooding but not necessarily um, playing the part in terms of that's the the, the main role okay and um, um so um as well as like green roofs okay so in terms of green roofs i know like in in uh, western countries they use green roofs a lot in terms to to uh, mitigate uh, runoff um, in, in urban areas but in malaysia this is still not being uh, implemented as much i think because of the weather factor that we have in malaysia and and therefore the maintenance factor of a green of a green roof is actually difficult to achieve um okay so i think that's that's my comment on in out uh, for your um first question uh, in terms of native and non-native species okay uh, this is very debatable still uh, from 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 where i studied and even even here in malaysia um and um I'm going to give you like a safe answer because I think this is still very um, in need of, of research in, on, on the specific species. So like I said, uh, different species. Uh, so so some, some native species, they do tend to um, thrive better. And I, I, I'm a believer of that as well. Um, that, uh, you know, we are 
adapted to the environment that we live in for so long and then due to climate change and plants plants tend to adapt because they have this physiological um, aspect in, in, in that they they adapt slowly to the environment to, to the surrounding environment that they live in okay but um, I know um, a professor when I was in Sheffield who is going around the world and is um, collecting different species of plants and then um, for, say for example uh, he is uh, going around the world in Africa in China in, in different parts of the world with different climatic um, conditions than um, the UK so he is collecting species and trying to adapt uh, to to, to um, make the, that particular plant survive in a different environment and some do actually um, work so I think um, research is is uh, more research needs to be conducted on, on that and more research and more experiments I think needs to be conduct, conducted on the specific uh, species related uh, uh, plant uh, so I think that's my that, that's my opinion on that um, in terms of um, good resources uh, for plants or plant selection any data database da database so um, if I think uh, there, there are a lot of databases that you can search on um, the internet. But one that I particularly use is uh, PFAF. So it's Plants for a Future. So if you look this up, so they will provide like um, a column or like a tab where you can find um, plants that are suitable for um, carbon sequestration, that are suitable for medicine, medicinal purposes, for um, for different parts of um, um, benefits that, that, that plants can provide. So you can look this up uh, through this PFAF uh, database, which is what I personally used. Okay, thank you. I, I, thank, you. thank you for your question. Thank you, Dr. Haslina and Han, uh, Norhana. Uh, there is another question in chat. Uh, let me read for you. Uh, there is a question to uh, Dr. Maslina Mansor uh, from Tasya Salsabila, a student from ITERA. Uh, she'd like to ask about uh, how can we apply parklet or care blade in a busy big road and make sure it is safe for both pedestrian and FECO users. And how can we optimize the function of it while still giving aesthetic values and unique uniqueness in it. Thank you in advance. Uh, for Dr. Maslina, uh, would you like to answer Tasia's question? Okay, thank you for the questions. Okay, uh, this is talking about the parklet and curblet uh, in, uh, in the city. Uh, in terms of safety and uh, uh, for uh, how can we provide a safe, uh, safety uh, and also the assistive function of it. I think that uh, depends on the selection of the the location. So for parklet and curblet, usually uh, in a city center, they have uh, different types of uh, road uh, road width uh, road width. Uh, so we have to uh, uh, to to do location. Uh, 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 to put it at, at an appropriate uh, location. For example, taking a uh, parking space that are uh, the, the most appropriate uh, in location uh, uh, in relation to other uh, other road connection, eh, the circulation. I think that one, uh, it's hard for me to point out exactly where, but uh, I think it, it should be based on the, uh, the, the, the uh, hierarchy of the, uh, the road system. Uh, yeah, and in terms of uh, again, they're talking about safety, uh, talking about aesthetic uh, values and unique. So I, I think that's uh, that's that's uh, about the question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Maslina, for your answer. And there is another uh, question from Hafiz RD. Uh, I'd like to ask to uh, Miss uh, Dr. Hannah Ismail. Uh, we know that there are so many differences between the rural landscape and urban landscape, especially the easy ac access that we get uh, at a uh, public facility in urban landscape. So my uh, this question is: uh, Can we create or design landscape with rural typical atmosphere? but also accessible to various facilities that we get in urban landscape. Thank you in advance. 
Uh, and there is a question for, uh, from Hafiz again to Dr. Maslina Mansur. Uh, she'd like to, uh, he'd like to ask uh, about is rain garden also categorized as a landscape space in urban context? If they are, can you please explain about the application of it? Thank you in advance. Uh, so uh, please, uh, you can, would you like to answer uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hanna Ismail? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Septi. Okay. Um, I I'm reading the the questions by uh, Mr. Hafiz R D. So you are saying uh, you are talking about the differences between um, rural and urban landscape and about the um, accessibility. Could you could you just explain to me a little bit what you mean by um, easy access to public facilities? Like what, what is uh, easy easy access to uh, get to a public facility in urban landscape? I mean, it's about uh, accessible facility, ma'am. Sorry, such as like urban transportation. Ah. Uh, uh, okay. Um. I think um, okay for for me from my from my uh, personal point of view the like you said the differences between um, the the surrounding environment between urban and rural areas um, is uh, there are many differences and uh, the reasons to why um, uh, many uh, people are moving from rural rural areas to uh, urban areas is uh, mainly because of um, easier. Uh, access to, to different facilities. And um, I think uh, in terms of uh, creating landscape design, um, I wouldn't say uh, there, there would be, uh, I mean, obviously there would be differences in, in terms of the um, cultural aspects because, uh, you know, uh, if you are designing um, an urban park, the, the elements might be a little different compared to what you would design in a rural um, area. So um, in terms of um, sorry, uh, the question is, can you create lands with rural, rural, rural typical atmosphere, but also various ways that we get in urban landscape? I would say uh, yes. I would say that because because as landscape architects, you are able to 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 provide this accessibility for your for the user of your park. So it, it depends on how you give um, easy access or easy um, accessibility uh, in in your design, but. I think that would be uh, uh, feasible in, in uh, landscape design. Did, did that uh, answer your question, um, Mr. Haf yes. Hafiz? Yeah, it's enough. Thank you okay. so much, ma'am. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, this uh, for the question. The next question is for me talking about uh, by Mrs. Kia uh, asking question about the rain garden, um, which are also categorized as a landscape spaces in urban context. If they are, can you please explain uh, about the application of it? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the uh, rain gardens, uh, they have uh, or bioswale, uh, they have a quite a similar, uh, there is not quite much difference in terms of their different, I think maybe uh, Dr. Hana can explain it further because uh, she studied it in detail in terms of the functions of the plants uh, and I think in her lecture uh, she talked about uh, how the plants use uh, for bioswale. Uh, for uh, for urban areas, uh, are they considered as uh, one of the landscape spaces? Uh, I think yes, uh, most probably because they are located uh, along the street, but they have a special functions to cater for environmental solution or street uh, green infrastructure solutions uh, to catch uh, the runoff water from uh, the road. Yeah, uh, uh, the road. Uh, and catching it into this uh, bioswale or the this rain garden, so they has uh, they they have an environmental functions in terms of their capability uh, to solve uh, flooding uh, and um, 
and give a, a bit of a greenery to the streets, yeah, to, to the street landscape. So they are in the category, I can say, in a, a street landscape. We can see this uh, application mostly in developed countries, but not not much here because of uh, um, uh, the 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 rainfall. Eh? The, maybe the, the too much rain uh, uh, need to get uh, need to get a certain type of. Uh, how much bioswale can we provide in order to cater for that much rain? And then also the issue on uh, rubbish on the roads. Yeah, when uh, uh, when uh, we don't have maintenance, good man maintenance, uh, and um, uh, that sort of things, uh, the bioswale uh, in the future, if it is not maintained, then it will become like a rubbish trap as well. Uh, uh, in um, I think. Um, uh, for this uh, application, most probably uh, for a new street, yeah, a design of a new township, uh, we can apply it uh, uh, to cater for this environmental uh, green infrastructure solutions. Uh, very good, actually, very good uh, design. Um, for the uh, if it is, uh, uh, if we if we can use it, uh, how it is applied? I think uh, based on the selections of plants. Um, in terms of uh, the most suitable plants that can absorb uh, uh, um, that can absorb the water fast, um, the the compos uh, composition of the uh, those planting elements, uh, as well as the design uh, of the uh, the bioswale or the rain gardens. Yeah, I think uh, I hope I answer uh, his uh, question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Maslina, uh, for answering. And there is another question, if you don't mind. Uh, 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 there is a question for Zulfita Amanda right. uh, to Dr. Maslina. Uh, she'd like to ask about how many percentage of rain garden that can decrease the runoff in macro scales, except in both sides of streets, uh, where the price of uh, if it can be applied uh, on your minds in urban. Uh, thank you. Mm, I have no exact answer for it because I think mm -hmm. uh, that depends on the <laughs> the, the, yes, uh, the the length of the street and so on. I have I, uh, uh, honestly I don't have the the exact answer on the percentage. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Um, Maslina, can, can I just uh, just yeah maybe uh, uh, Dr. Hana can add to that. I mean, uh, same as you, I, I wouldn't have an exact answer in terms of um, how how much um, a rain garden can actually reduce um, runoff in urban areas. But um, uh, I would first uh, like to um, also add to Dr. Kapina's uh, um, answer about um, how to apply um, urban gardens. Um, I think in addition to um, plant choices, the, the type of um, soil that is used in rain gardens is actually different compared to when you are planting in a normal um planting uh, no, for normal plantings okay so it, uh, urban uh, sorry um, rain gardens usually have um, uh, uh, they, we, they call it as um, engineered soil so basically the, com the the composition of the soil is a mixture of of not only just normal peat soil it's they usually have um, pebbles in in it to to um, allow drainage to to flow faster okay so this this uh, actually applies to um, a lot of um, rainwater uh, or sorry storm water management strategies so such as rain gardens and even green roofs okay uh, so so the, the the apart from choosing the appropriate plant species the type of soil is actually very very important in to, to um, allow uh, very good drainage of um, rainfall. So in terms of um, how, uh, oh, sorry, where this can be applied in mi macro scale, um, the, uh, apart from, from the cost, uh, it does uh, actually require a lot more cost compared to the, the normal uh, parks or normal urban, urban parks. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, it men it's mentioned here, except for both sides of the streets, where else can this um, rain garden be applied? So actually, um, even, even rain gardens can be applied even in your homes. Um, from 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 bigger scale to actually uh, smaller scale. So even if, if you have homes that have um, land outside of your house, you can make a difference by by providing and creating rain gardens by by simply um, uh, choose appropriate plantings that are uh, resilient 
to um, flooding or to um, waterlogging environment. And also by um, adding uh, pebbles and, and stones inside uh, as a mixture of your soil to allow um, faster drainage. So uh, you, this can be implemented at the, just right in front of your house and, and as, as well as along streets. But in terms of macro scale, I think this might, it, it can be done, but it's just um, in, in um, developing countries, it may take up uh, a lot more than just uh, like a, a, a implementing um, uh, a normal uh, urban park. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hana. Uh, uh, there is one last question uh, 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 directed to Hana Ismail from uh, Mr. Safni Sukmana. Uh, Mr. Safni Sukmana, please, uh, you can ask, sir. Well, thank you for the second opportunity. So this is going to be a very quick uh, question to Dr. Hana. Yeah? So uh, you mentioned some species in your research, and uh, those are uh, some tropical species, right? So like Hosta and Brigania and uh, what is it, Dianthus and things like that uh, for the stormwater uh, management, urban stormwater management. Is there any uh, species that you would suggest in uh, tropical countries to be planted in the, the stormwater management uh, scenario? If you don't have uh, any strong, what is it like science based uh, species, then probably you can mention your own favorite plan uh, that maybe I can also adopt that here in Jakarta. Thank you. Because I'm, I'm really concerned in a stormwater management uh, design as well as a, as a designer and as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. Thank you so um, much. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I have a, a specific uh, recommendation, but I can, I can give you some, uh, just like, um, like a, I would say a home tip, because um, based on my um, observation, if you choose like broad leaf plants, um, they are usually really hard to care for, okay, and, and um, they, they, they tend to be less resilient. So, uh, uh, like I said, like I, like I mentioned before, because in, in tropical climate uh, uh, regions, we are blessed with very, very beautiful uh, broadleaf plants, which actually um, uh, gives beautiful, uh, 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 what do you say, uh, aesthetical values. But in terms of caring uh, for those type of uh, species, it's actually um, harder compared to plants um, that are, um, I wouldn't say non-native, but, but uh, not um, broadleaf uh, species. So um, uh, I, I don't, I'm sorry about this, but I don't have like a specific recommendation or, or, right. or a, uh, like a favorite plant to, to, to um, uh, provide to you. But I think um, it, it, it depends on uh, the, the, the care of the plants. Right. So like I said, like broadleaf plants is actually uh, very hard to care for. You, it needs to be um, in the sun and out of the sun. So so uh, it, it, it's, it's like uh, species based, uh, it's, it's, it's very species specific. So um, I think it, that would be, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a recommendation for you. Yeah, that's all right. Thank you. So probably we have to look at the um, grass family plants probably. Because like yes, yes. Lomandra longifolia is like the killer plant for any rain mm. so Yeah. They will plant a lot in the rain gardens because it's yes. really, really hardy and very, uh, yes. Difficult to keep. Yes, that's true. Because even for my research, uh, Fasuka is is a grass family, and it it has shown to be the most uh, resilient in terms of um, waterlogging and also a drought tolerance um, uh, species. So, um, grass family is definitely easy easier to care to care for. True, yeah. true. Maybe we have to uh, grow a uh, saray in our rain garden. Yes, <laughs> you, yes Dr. definitely. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hanna and Maslina, who have uh, answered all the questions from the participants. And before we go to the next uh, session, uh, let me remind you that for participants to give you feedback by accessing the link in chat to get the easy certificate. Jadi, mohon participan untuk memberikan feedbacknya lewat link yang sudah di, uh, diberikan melalui uh, chat. Nah, mohon diisi untuk mendapatkan e-sertifikatnya ya. Nah, 
before we close this uh, international uh, lecture, uh, 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 would you like to give us closing statement for, to audience uh, or participant, Dr. Naslina and Dr. Sinti Nurhana Ismail? Hello, uh, uh, Dr. Hana, uh, would you like to, uh, yes. to give us uh, the closing speech? Uh, okay. This, this, uh, this international lecture. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so um, I, I would first of all uh, like to thank um, uh, Itera for inviting me for this um, a sharing session. Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say like a lecture. I would say it's more of a sharing session in which I can first of all share what um, can be done as uh, landscape architects apart from um, the 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 role of landscape landscape architects of um, designing and creating green spaces. We should also look at the the functional. Uh, uh, ability of, of what landscapes can do okay because now um, as we are facing um, many uh, climate crisis climate change crisis I think um, like I mentioned before we as landscape architect architects our role is even bigger than uh, creating green spaces okay um, and and I would also like to add a part because because um, a, to me, uh, green space, the, the provision of green spaces in an urban area is important not only to cater for environmental uh, problems or environmental issues, um, it's also um, important in terms of create, um, uh, providing benefits for the urban residents in, 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 case, in the case that um, uh, pro by providing recreation, recreational spaces, which helps in mental, mental and um, health well-being. So those are the 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 the, the importance of of um, urban green spaces, um, apart from just creating uh, spaces for uh, sorry, apart from uh, providing urban ecosystem services. Um, uh, I think I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hana, for the closing speech. And uh, uh, Dr. Maslina, would you like to? Yeah, give sorry, us you call me just now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much uh, to the organizing committee in Itera, uh, especially to the dean of Department of Technology Infrastructure, uh, Dr. Rahayu, and also the Dean of uh, Landscape Architecture Department, uh, Dr. Bambang, uh, and uh, to the staff uh, and students and who are participating in this uh, program. Um, I really appreciate it uh, for inviting us to, to your university. Yeah? Um, I hope that uh, my little sharing, eh, sharing of knowledge, uh, would be very useful uh, to you, especially to the students in Itera, eh, because I, I believe that the large participants are coming from the students in landscape architecture in in the department. Um, and um, uh, last but not least, um, inshallah, in the future, uh, when things get normal. Uh, uh, inshallah we can uh, meet again okay thank you very much yeah thank you very much uh, dr masina uh, for That's the closing speech uh, before uh, i close this lecture uh, let uh, allow me to take a picture for our documentation uh, for all participants please turn on your camera uh, yeah. mm. Okay, uh, Mbak Kopi, uh, silakan mulai fotonya ya, mohon uh, bantuan ya. Uh, one, two, three. Belum. Uh, okay. Again, please, uh, we can check it again. Uh, Yeah, one, two, three. Have you done yet, uh, Miss Poppy? Okay. 
Can uh, I'm sorry. Uh, please take it. Uh, yeah. Can we please take it again? Slide selanjutnya. Oke. Please uh, uh, turn on your camera. Uh, Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Uh, one other slide again. Okay. Please turn on your camera. Iya. Oke, Mbak Kopi udah juga. Udah semua. Oh, ya. uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, the, for this session for all participant and speakers and lastly uh, Dr. Bambang uh, have you uh, any word uh, before I close this session uh, this lecture okay okay uh, of course uh, Uh, we would uh, express uh, our thanks to Dr. Maslina and Dr. Hanna uh, that uh, have uh, gave uh, for us the very, very important uh, uh, experience uh, from them. This is very useful, of, of course, for us, for the students especially of the uh, landscape architecture program. And uh, I also <coughs> uh, concerned with the, the future collaboration. Maybe we, we can uh, conduct the uh, like a student uh, collaborative student workshop in the next uh, semester. Uh, would, you, would you please uh, join again and bring some student from Malaysia to ITERA and we can Uh, work together to uh, to make uh, some project here. Thank you uh, very much for Dr. Masina and Dr. Ha, and thank you for the committee uh, for uh, all of the preparation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bambang, for the closing speech. And lastly, uh, we finally reached the last session. Uh, as a moderator, I'm sorry for some mistake I've made uh, during this lecture. Uh, lastly, thank you for internal le lecture uh, who spoken in this lecture and all particip participants who joined this lecture. Uh, it's been a pleasure with all of you today. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.